Hello everyone out there in Facebook land and YouTube land. This is Susan Gerbic and I am in conversation with another very interesting friend of mine who's in the, the scientific skeptic world. And this is going to be a well, this is the second time Rob's been on, actually, but the, he was on our very first episode called uh, Belief in Psychics. And uh, this time we changed the format right after Rob did that. And it's been more of a conversation instead of a lecture, which I'm still up for. I really enjoyed the lecture. I thought that was a lot of fun. And I am now going to be talking to Rob and we're going to be ch chatting back and forth uh, like old friends are and shooting the breeze, as my dad used to say. And who are you again? <laughs> so we're going to be talking. Um, if you have questions for Rob Palmer, who's also known as a well-known skeptic, you can put him in the chat on Facebook. Um, and we will eventually be sharing this video to our YouTube channel, which we would appreciate if you would subscribe to. It's called About Time Presents, or no, About Time Project. And we're going to be talking to um, more people. There's a lot of interviews on there, as well as the the very first about time presents is with Rob Palmer and anyway yeah, that was that was fun but it was weird because it was my first zoom presentation I've done one since and you know I don't really I don't prefer that to doing it live for sure because uh because the way zoom works in that sense is you're cutting everyone else's microphone off so you're doing it to a dead screen it's like it was the same react you know for me it was the same as when I just practiced it in the room alone I mean, for all I know, the internet had dropped out. And I was wasting an hour <laughs> talking. Literally, there was no feedback at all to any little thing I might have joked about or anything on the screen. Just dead silence, and that it's is weird. really weird. It is very weird. It is very strange. I did one with the Sydney skeptics um, in the pub, and same kind of thing. But they had it set up. It wasn't over Zoom. It was over something else. So I could see the organizers. It's like four organizers, and they were just like you know, just looking around, and I'm thinking. I hope they every I, I thought they would let me know if at least the channel had dropped out but there was no feedback they were just like mm. so so picture if you were a comedian doing it, how bad that would be we we used to go to a comedy club in Aruba and the people who ran the club Aruba Ray's comedy club are now doing zoom sessions every week we, we, which we've attended a lot on Friday night they do it but the comedians are all talking and there's no laughing or anything and so yeah, that must be awful well, Stephen Colbert, I still watch him. Yeah, Same yeah. thing. You're like he's yeah. his only audience is like maybe if his son or if his wife's there. Yeah. And he, that must be horrible, but he's a trooper and he just so I, I guess I should introduce you somewhat and you can introduce yourself for all the things I'm gonna forget. So for those people out there who do not know who Rob Palmer is, he is also known as the well-known skeptic. He is a member of the GSOW. Facetious. I want to say facetiously. That's my it, column. It, it's title. a fun. Yeah. It's a fun moniker, and yeah. and and it's kind of it was well, pretty true. I mean, you're becoming. Uh, more well I got known. slammed for that in the beginning by some people who saw my Facebook page. You got five hundred. You got fifty people following you. How the hell are you well known? <laughs> I'm getting more and more well known. Is well, it? I had seven thousand now. So okay. Woo! That's good. <laughs> so they, the, it's it's uh, there's a reason behind it, and he can explain it. But the point is, is that uh, Rob Palmer is one of our more active members of the GSOW project. I was going to go back and look and see when you joined, and I probably could do that really quickly. But August 19, 2016, I wrote you, Ms. Gerbic. I, I just found this yesterday. Heard you on the Skeptic Zone. How does one join the Guerrilla Army? <laughs> so there you go, August 19, Ms. Gerbic, 2016. Huh? Ms. Gerbic, yes. Aww. Usually I hear that from more people who are in uh, Europe. They're very formal, especially the Germans. Ms. Gerbeck, I must, you know, it's, it's much more formal. And, I, and people find them will get like, oh, she's not so rigid. I have had people in the, in the South America. Those people are casual. They're like, I've watched your videos. I know you're like, okay, and fun to talk to and stuff. So I'm just going to talk to you like I would a friend. And you're like, cool, because it's kind of how, yeah, Skeptic Zone. Um, I recently heard about the GSOW via interview with Susan Gerbic on the Skeptic Zone and am now interested in finding out more about joining your Wikipedia team. And it's great. And, and it's been a nice, it's been wonderful having you here. I, I hope that you've I, we'll get into that in a minute about uh, GSOW, but we've learned a lot from you, and there's been so much you've been active in. Also, Rob Palmer writes for Skeptical Inquirer magazine, and mainly online 
the online articles. He does a lot of interviews. He seems to have taken on psychics. Um, the grief vampire uh, world that I'm involved in, he has um, participated in a few of the stings as a person running a Facebook page on Operation Peach Pit. And he has done a lot of the audio um, promotions for the JSOW channel. He's just an all around guy who knows all kinds of stuff. And it's just really handy having him around. And uh, uh, we appreciate having you on our team. And I appreciate knowing you. And your friendship has been very valuable to me over the years. We, we chit chat all the time. And, ha and well, we thank can, you. My God, this is a love fest. Of no, course, no. I'm doing <laughs> only all this because of you. If you weren't an, an activist to get people involved, I would still be sitting yes, on my couch I find just, people just yelling like at you. my friends. Yeah. Well, this is my job. This is with the GSOW. Uh, the mission of the About Time Project is not to just write Wikipedia pages or to sting psychics. That is not my mission. And if you look at our mission statement on our uh, abouttimeproject.org website, you will see it's all about finding people like you who have been frustrated with social media experiences, arguing with people. You're not changing minds, but you want to become more active. You don't know where to start. You don't know who to, who do I talk to? What do I do? And I say, here you go. I will, I will help you be whatever it is you want to do and meet whoever you want to meet. And well, I, we could always have a seance, I guess, if you wanted to meet some, like <laughs> Asimov, which yeah, I'd like to do. That'll work. I mean, we could derange it. We do have Mark Edward in the house. So, I mean, it's possible. But um, so what do you want to add, Rob, to my long, lengthy? Well, um, yeah, so I'm not really that well known. And I started from scratch when I wrote that letter to Susan, jumped into the Gorilla Skeptics project. And as an aerospace mechanical engineer, I used to design spacecraft. So yes, I know the Earth is not actually flat. And I've had that argument with people uh, who say otherwise on Wikipedia. Um, I believed in all sorts of paranormal stuff, as most of us did when I was younger. A teenager, I distinctly remember tracking my biorhythms. I don't think that's popular anymore. So oh, I didn't remember, remember that. Too. Oh, yeah. I was, I was big when I was that age. And I, I think for a year, I had charts that I could stretch across my whole room, you know. And of course, it all correlated. You know, whatever it said made sense. It was kind of like a poor man's horoscope because there are only three things to track, you know. Um, I was big into alien abductions and ancient astronauts, Von Daniken. And uh, then I stumbled upon the Skeptical Inquirer magazine and my school library, I believe it was, and that was a shock. And I've heard you say these things too before. It's like you open it up and wait a minute, I, that's not true. And then how, but the other, how can people believe this? How you know, can so believe it's like that? whatever I believe Jesus. seems like it should be true, right? But that after months of reading, uh, and I got a subscription, reading all the magazines, I realized that most of what I came to accept because it was, you know, being told to me by Leonard Nimoy uh, on television or whatever, not when he was on Star Trek, but the other stupid show, uh, you know. In search all, of? Yes, all of those things were just nonsense. Um, so actually my most interesting thing of that time period was it was about the same time. I, I got a book from the library on aliens, and I, God, I wish I knew who the author was or what the book was, but I remember distinctly when it's every alien race, this author had been contacted by. He was a multiple abductee. He had pictures of the alien species as well as all the different spacecraft from the different planets, and I was just buying it hook, line, and sinker until I got to the last chapter, which was about the bases all over the moon. And now I realize this book was written like 15 years earlier before the space race, and now we have map the whole moon including the far side and there are no freaking cities there so it was like oh my god a book could be lying to me and that was another thing that was just a revelation that, oh that's well, interesting how old yeah. do you think you were when that just like 16 like 17 something like that same time about as a skeptical inquiry came about anyway so fa so fast forward a lot of years so, so i slowly came out of the believing in all one after the other Ouija boards and stuff like that uh because of skeptical inquiry i can't even i can't even picture you Oh, yeah. I mean, I, there, you know, I, there, there was no internet, right? We know that. So it was like you couldn't find counter information to this stuff. If you went to the library, you'd probably just find more pseudoscience crap. And, mm -hmm. and the television shows, there weren't that many because there wasn't cable yet. But still, what was on was just promoting, you know, nonsense. 
Um, not even as much as there is today, but at least today you can find counter information on the internet. Um, so I didn't do anything with all of that until 2012. Um, I got laid off from work. I had a lot of extra time and I found podcasting and I found the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. At as that point, it, yeah, it had already been on for, I don't know, eight years or something. And I went back and I listened to every episode while I was cleaning the house or doing yard work. And it was like, I, I think I heard every single episode. Did of you that start from the beginning and work your yes. way? Yes, yes, I did. And, and then I went through Perry DeAngelo's death. death, which was a shock to me. Mm. And I remember writing to the crew about how that moved me. Uh, yeah, and they must get letters like that all the time from people who they did do. what I did and start mm -hmm. from the beginning. Uh, yeah, that was sad. Um, but anyway, so I still didn't do anything for a number of years until I heard um, you, and I think maybe there was an interview with another GSOW person on skepticality and the skeptic zone, and that's what got me to you know dial in. It took me a while. That was 2012, 2013-ish, and still I didn't write you that letter till 2016. But I finally decided because actually a friend drove me to the brink. It was the last straw of her crazy woo-ness. Oh yeah, tell the story, tell the story. Uh, a, a friend, uh, uh, I'll just call her Chris. Uh, we were really good friends as kids. We went to each other's wedding and then she moved and we lost track. And I found her maybe 2015 or so back through Facebook and we reconnected and we were talking and whatever. And then it quickly became obvious she was the queen of woo. And she had a huge following because of her field. And all of her friends were into it. Everything you can imagine, crystal healing and every conspiracy, um, you know, everything besides flat earth. I once said, this sounds like flat eartherism and she got really insulted, you know. Oh, it's okay to believe in chemtrails and that medical science has a cure for cancer is not telling everybody, but flat earth is a, you know, a bridge too far. But, <laughs> but I was basically being slammed by all of her friends every time I would try to inject. I didn't do it all the time, just when it was, it seemed critical, like, you know, in fact, she's crying herself to sleep because her father died a needless death from cancer because they wouldn't give him the cure. And I'm trying to just, no, that can't be. You know how many people in the world would have to be involved in a conspiracy like that? Try to inject some reason like that. And I would just get slammed by her and all her friends. And so, you know, I didn't unfriend her, but I unfollowed her because I couldn't stand seeing every day one of her posts. And that's actually one of the reasons that I said, okay, maybe I can do something on the internet on uh, Wikipedia. And that's when I contacted you. And, and and the world is a better place because the Wikipedia has been improved. And I want to and let's let's start off with GSOW before we get into the psychics and some of the other things because you know I, I I absolutely adore the Wikipedia project. Uh, <laughs> but um, okay, so people joined GSOW. You you joined when we were on Facebook in the Secret Cabal, right? Yes. You weren't on the forum. No, I didn't know about that. Okay, so we had a forum we tried for a while and it just, we were trying to build this forum where people would go and they would edit Wikipedia and drain and all that. And it was horrible. It was just a mess. It, it just, people use Facebook. And so, you know, I got talked into coming back to Facebook and using that. And we made a secret cabal. It's a uh, hidden Facebook group that only has GSOW members in it, trained and untrained. Some people have been there for, you know, since we since I started the GSOW project and before. Just for the record, it's where we control Wikipedia from. That's where we control the world from. It's the world. We run the world from there, yeah. All the knowledge in the world in all languages actually falls through the secret cabal. Uh, not Chinese, unfortunately, right? I know, we don't have any Asian languages at all. So, you know, we, we gotta get on that. But anyway, uh, we, <laughs> so I started this Facebook group that's a secret group where people can talk freely about the the work we do and train and so on and uh rob had joined in 2016 you went through training your first page you wrote was thomas bob the was what that, was no. it the, which Al was no alan hale the other the other discoverer of the oh company. hale bob <laughs> remember hale bob alan, alan hale alan hale uh, the the to finish training with us, you have to rewrite a Wikipedia page that's in bad shape. And we, for a lot of reasons, I have it that you have to rewrite a page and not create a page because creating a page is so much more difficult and it's also very likely it could get deleted because of reasons yeah, of notability. Tell me about it. Yes, you do know all about that. So he rewrote the Wikipedia page for uh, the hail part of the hail bop comment. 
And then oh, that's right. We had someone else on the team do the other part that you made. I thought you did, Bob. No. no so another, I think I was complaining, there. saying, how could one person have such a beautiful Wikipedia page now yeah. and the other guy has yeah. such a crappy looking Wikipedia yeah. page and somebody came in and created the Thomas Bob? Yeah. Wikipedia. Yeah, you're right. I remember. So astronomy has always been something that's interested you. And so being able to come in and rewrite a Wikipedia page on one of the co-discoverers on of Hell Bop must have been something. Yeah, that, a comet I actually remember going to look at at the, tell, at tell the me New about Jersey that. Shore with the. Oh, the wasn't training, it? Uh, as you remember, and and rewriting was what? the page. The training, as you remember it, because it's trained. The training has changed since then, but. Um. So it was days and days of of listening to Susan and videos, such to the point where when I was. I was waking up, I would hear her voice in my head, uh, just because that's the only voice I'd heard for days. So Susan, that, you guys, that's not happening anymore. I heard oh, interesting. Say, okay. I so heard Susan, 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 say that. Susan did was, videos. He was playing really, in the back of their dreams. They yes, would exactly. voice. Susan, so take your cursor and play. And there, were, <laughs> and, there, that's right. and there were some things to read in text, but it was mostly at that time videos of, of you going with with web pages shown and how you would make changes and then i would go and do the lesson and, and and so forth i think i did it fairly rapidly if i remember not maybe on record time but fairly soon uh fairly quickly because i wanted to get that over with and yes then i then i picked uh, Al, i was looking through your whole list of who to do and i said wow the discover of the comet and i looked at his page and it absolutely sucked so yes i i, re I redid his and uh, you know i thought one of the really cool things would be maybe i get to talk to the guy but you know so it turns out that Dr. Alan Hale is, is a recluse and uh, like doesn't use the internet, doesn't use it, doesn't reply to email, doesn't have a Facebook account, and like, even contacts who Susan knew as a go-between couldn't get him to answer us. And all we wanted was a photograph because the one photograph that was legal to use on Wikipedia, frankly, sucks. And then I, and I had to use that one. Uh, you know, we gave him months and he never replied. So. He's out looking for more comments. Yeah, that's what he's doing. I guess. And I'm just looking right now. And that Wikipedia page for Alan Hill, the astronomer, was published. You published it September 22nd, 2016. And it has 90,000 views. <laughs> that's 90,012. <laughs> that's so, 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 so the people who don't know this, I'm going to put this in context. I mentioned this. Yeah. By the way, I've gone uh, on sort of a mini tour doing presentations about the guerrilla skeptics to try to recruit people, including I spoke at PsyCon uh, for the first time. Uh, Twice? On the, on the, yeah, so that was my first presentation on guerrilla skeptics. And one of the things I mentioned that people don't generally know this is how popular Wikipedia is. I mean, everybody uses it, but they don't think about it. And it, the last time I looked, there's a, there's a web tracking service called Alexa, not the one that you get in your house. Uh, but it it does the, you know, okay, how many people hit how many sites per day and whatever. And by their reckoning, Wikipedia is the fourth largest website in, in the English speaking world that gets hit on a, on, you know, per viewed basis. And only above that are um, YouTube, Facebook, and Google. So, you know, none of those are information bastions, you know, and Google just points to Wikipedia. So that gives you an idea of the power of putting something on Wikipedia rather than on a personal web page, mm -hmm. if you can at all do that. Yeah, I've had people contact me and say, oh, why don't you write a web page that does this? Oh, well, that's ridiculous. Yeah, and even by the way, writing a book. Um, Mark Edward, who, who uh, actually you know, wrote several books, including Psychic Blues, might have a handle on this, but from researching it, what I found out is the average nonfiction book in its whole lifetime of printing only sells 3,000 copies. The number Susan just gave for this one article, you can never do that being an author. Mm -hmm. I mean, right? If you hit you hit pay dirt and get really lucky, maybe, or if you write, you know, a non a, a fiction thing like Harry Potter, of course. But uh, you know, a science book or something about that, three thousand in a lifetime. And and how, how many did this one article? Ninety thousand pages. Yeah, a, 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 now we don't know if they're reading the whole page over. Right, sure. But then again, if you buy a book, it doesn't Absolutely mean you Absolutely, you don't. Know, right. I have so many books on my shelf, I never <laughs> open. <laughs> That's my world. It tracks that. So I love that book. But yeah. So look, I have the book, but I yeah. have not read it yet. And it will, it keeps accumulating other books on top of it. So it's not likely to get, I feel really bad. I, I did read Psychic Blues. I was supposed I to read. I did read Psychic Blues, though. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I read that many times. But then again, so somebody could be going to the Wikipedia page multiple times to get information off yep. of it for their school report. Some some middle schooler somewhere, I guarantee, has plagiarized that page. 
for their book report. I know they have. <laughs> I have a niece. I'm proud of them at, too. They probably have a woman's the report. Uh, she was probably, I don't know, 13-ish at the time from what I remember. And she told me this was years later that she had written a Wikipedia page so that she would have something to cite in the paper she had to write for school, including <laughs> fake citations on it. And, <laughs> and so she, oh, anyone can write anything on Wikipedia. It's like, okay, that used to be true. Just try it now. And yeah, then I told right. her about my Kenny Biddle freaking page with 32 citations, you know, from like New York Times and People Magazine and Popular Mechanics. No, nope, not good enough. Got deleted. Oh my gosh. Don't even get us started on the Kitty Bill. That's like. I'm sorry, I went there. Poor Kenny. Poor Kenny. But it'll happen someday. I have confidence. I'm someday. playing the long game. We're going to. I'm wearing a shirt, good. by the way. Advertising Asking for Kenny. Questions to this is from his shop. Solving mysteries. Really? I didn't really see. He was talking about having a shop. Is it I am Kenny Biddle or is it? Well, you can, I'm sure you could, that's his main page. I'm sure you, I don't remember the name of the shop, but you could find it from there. Yeah, it's a cool I'm idea. Look like I, I like this design. In fact, I did a joint presentation with Kenny and we both wore the shirt. So that was kind of funny. I'm going to have to, do you like mine? Big Pharma Shillin? <laughs> I didn't read it. That's good. Can you see it right side? I'm so mad about that. I mean, you told me yeah. I'd be getting checks. I know. I, you know, I wrote the Science Moms page, and I didn't get anything. Was they're, they're probably sitting in the same spot where mine are, or or somewhere in New Jersey where you are, in a tree, in under a rock. You just haven't found them yet. They, we have. They have to <sighs> get to you just subtly. This was given to me by um, a man who wrote. Uh, a series of cartoons that were scientific, scientific skeptic cartoons called uh, Carbon Comics. Oh, I remember and, you uh, One of the conferences I went to, he says, I have a shirt just for you, Susan. Come over here, I gotta give you my shirt. The shirt, and I love it, but I can't wear it too much because it's that, I'm afraid it's gonna, if I wear, wear it too much, it's gonna, yeah. yes, yeah, so I have to be really careful to turn it inside out when I wash it. Oh, anyway. No, oh, I never wash this one, laundry. but you know, we're on Zoom, so you, you can't <laughs> tell that from... So uh, going back to your Wikipedia work, um, you've done, I'm looking at uh, now, you've written 24 pages <coughs> over the few years you've been here. 24 pages is a lot of pages to write, but it's a little tiny, tiny blip in the world of how many pages there are for Wikipedia. I don't know how long it's been since you've looked to see how many numbers, because we keep track of all these pages. We have a way of, we use something we, um, Kyle Polish wrote from, for us. Thank you, Kyle. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. It's we call it Dat the Bad, the, Stat the, Badger. Data, the Data Skeptic Podcast. Data Skeptic Podcast. Check it out. So I call it Stat Badger just because I did. Um, I'm really good at naming things, um, but <laughs> apparently. But those 24 Wikipedia pages you've written, Rob, as of the last time this uploaded, are 4,918,517 pages. Can you freaking believe it? Uh, that's uh, it's amazing. I remember looking Stop. at the beginning of it where the, the stat badger would tell us how many people were reading it on a daily basis and weekly basis. And I kept saying, holy shit, that's a Shea Stadium. I'm from New York. That's a Shea Stadium full of people every other day. It's like, <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. It, it, it blows my mind. And we're really conscious about writing the lead that's the first part of the Wikipedia page because we we think we know that most people go and read the lead, maybe look at the info box, maybe look at the personal section, and they're out of there. Yeah. So we were very careful about how we write that lead. And you've kind of been um, popularized, at least within the group, to make sure that we put on, um, I don't know what, a, a box that says like, pseudoscience oh the tags yeah yeah yeah, yeah so it's Wikipedia a big allows kind of like a little picture that it's like a stamp you basically you can think of it like if you're buying a product and had a big stamp on it that said this is phony you know that helps so yeah the, the wikipedia has several like that one called alt medicine and one called uh paranormal yeah and you can just at a glance you could yeah. just go oh yeah. okay. although you know to a believer it might not matter because oh good it's paranormal you know <laughs> well they might look alt at med. it i don't want to go that why is it stuff. why do they call this why do they say that? You know, why are they saying this? This is paranormal. Right, and, why and if you open up the box medicine? and it says all the things that are categorized as paranormal, even a believer in something might think the other stuff is crap. So that might be a good hint, right? Because it's a whole list of stuff that's paranormal. It's changing the world. I know we are changing yeah. people's minds because, as you said, when you go to your friend's Facebook page and they're making these ridiculous claims, nobody's listening to you. You're, you're putting comments in there. They're not reading those citations you're putting in there. They're just going, you're just mean. Oh, you're yeah. Mean. 
Why are you so mean to people? Why can't you just let people be? Why can't we just believe in psychics? Why do you have to keep throwing stuff at us? We're not. Oh, you're psychic. You're reading my email. (laughs) So that's the point. And this is a big thing I believe in. I really believe that you can't attack people for their beliefs unless, of course, they're really about to harm somebody. I mean, if it's like, I'm not going to go through chemo. I'm not going to do any of my stuff. I'm 40 years old and I'm not going to do any of that because I believe that it's going to, whatever reason. And you know that they have a really good shot at at kicking their cancer's ass if they go through the chemo. And, you know, if it's in that niche where, no, this is immediate, we have to intercede. Okay, then I think you have to have a direct talk with somebody about it. No, 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 no. You are going to the doctor. You could do all the... I'll take you to your Reiki healing sessions after you have your chemo. <laughs> you know, sure, no problem. You can do all the acupuncture you want, but we're going to chemo first. And then after your chemo, you know, so it's important for people to save face. And we know that people save face. You and I both are the are walking, talking people who believed in the paranormal. Nobody yelled at me and said, Bigfoot is not real, Susan. What an idiot you are. You're not going to burst into flame any second. (laughs) Spontaneous human combustion, you guys. I'm still kind of creeped out about that. But the idea is is that... Mine is abduction being dragged out of bed and uh, frozen. Oh, that's terrifying. Taken through the window into a spacecraft, yeah. Oh, God. Did they open the window first? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you don't go through a plate glass. No. That would be really (laughs) scary. I mean, maybe they could fix your wounds or something. I don't know. But the idea that telling somebody they're an idiot is not going to work or usually doesn't work what has to happen is you let it gradually implant these ideas in their head that hmm, maybe maybe you know if people were spontaneously combusting on the street maybe we would hear about it on the news maybe maybe we would have you ever seen anybody spontaneously combust do you know anybody who spontaneously combusted? How do, why are all people who spontaneously combust? We don't know if it's spontaneous. They're also like, why, why, why are they like overweight smoking next to a fireplace where they fell towards it? With their flammable heads in there. clothes on and you find them later. Yeah. Why? why? <laughs> and so people do research and that means they go to Google or whatever search engine they're using and they find a Wikipedia page. And because Wikipedia is like Goldilocks, it's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's right in the middle. No ads, no pop-ups. We know how to use it. We know how to click on those little blue links to go into further information they go to wikipedia just to check it out you just look and so the next day at work whenever you're talking to that friend they say i did some research on this and you know what i kind of don't think i don't think and they what they mean is they went to wikipedia right and you are oh my gosh now that you're retired you can talk about this but oh my lord you would constantly be meeting up with people at work and having arguments with them about the craziest things these are engineers so that's freaking me out already and they would and then rob would go home rewrite the wikipedia page and come back and go hey have you read the wikipedia page of that yeah the most memorable one about that was uh just over the over over the wall somebody in my team was like bragging about what bragging uh, talking up uh kt tape uh kinesio tape Oh yeah, he uses it all the time. His brother usually swears by it. It helps this and this and this. And I and I go over, uh, what are you talking about? And I actually <laughs> had not even heard of it. So before I walked over, I Googled it. I, it. There was a Wikipedia page. It wasn't very good at all. And it was a little bit too middle of the road for my taste, right? But I just basically went over and I said, no. And he said, oh, prove that to me. Okay, let me get back to you tomorrow. So I, I did go home and I, I fix the wikipedia page to put all the scientific criticism on it and then i the next day i sent him the page and he comes back yeah rob i, I don't know maybe it's not true <laughs> so that was good and let's look at the hits on that page so you wrote that page in march of 2018 elastic therapeutic tape is what it's called yeah 281,000 views since, since, I, you made since it, I did it, you made it live. <laughs> yeah. Well, because that topic people gets, our offices everywhere are, yeah, are reading. If people don't know what that is, that po- that topic gets popular every time there's a new Olympics, especially, and even sometimes there's a new sport a season for some sport, uh, where especially where you can see someone's skin, not necessarily football, um, like maybe or figure skating for sure. 
uh, because what happens is the athletes, you know, either buy into it or they get paid to wear this tape and they go out. And in fact, one of them, I think uh, Dunning looked into it and, and talked about it, like the whole team was paid by the company to wear the tape. And, you know, and so anyway, the Olympics start, people watch it. You see, oh, look at that. What is that? Then you start right. Googling it. Oh, look, this, this works because they see all these people selling it and the athletes are wearing it. So it must be real. But now at least there's this Wikipedia article, which is in reasonable shape to put down in people's minds. It's like cupping, same thing happens with cupping. But now we should be clear, when you go and you rewrite these Wikipedia pages, everybody out there watching, this is done correctly. It's not- No, like I just do whatever I want. No one, else, no one else can challenge me. I do whatever I want. No, it's not like that at all. Of course, Rob is having to use the rules, all the rules of Wikipedia, only things that can be on the Wikipedia page are, are uh, things that are reliable sources. There's a lot of rules. Plus, once you make it live, Rob has no power over it any more than any other editor. Right. So he makes so need, changes live, and do... other editors look at it, too, and it's last. Right. So period. the way I've put, pointed this out is, is it is a corporate philosophy uh, like that you have to follow, right? If you, if you do things differently than everyone else in your company has been trained to do, you you're not going to be successful. So it's the same thing with the Wikipedia organization. The editors have worked for decades uh, and they know how to do things. There are rules. There is, Wikipedia has so many rules and guidelines. You, you could fill many books if you were to print them out on a page about how you're supposed to do things and how you're not supposed to do things. And if you do something that doesn't follow the rules, it immediately gets taken out. Uh, so anyone who thinks, which a lot of people do, that we can just do whatever we want on there doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. And that happens all Obviously. the time. Yeah. All the time. Always saying right. they changed yeah. it or they, and yeah. it's like a conspiracy <laughs> to hear these people just going, I'm like, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that you were a Wikipedia editor. Please explain, you know, how that works yeah. to me. Or I'll yeah. say, what's your Wikipedia username? I'd love to read what you've been writing. And they're like, I don't know anything about Wikipedia. <laughs> Right. You're like, but well, then it's amazing how it's presented. Me? These people always I present, I would say always, almost always present it like it's a fact, right? Not, this is my speculation. Like I would be, if I didn't know something, I believe it works like this. I'd, I'd say it's something like that, right? This, don't you know how Wikipedia works? This is how it works. They can go on and do anything they want as if they know this for a fact and they know nothing. It's exact reverse of what they're saying. They know nothing. The, uh, now it is possible for most Wikipedia pages to go in and make an edit on the Wikipedia page. I mean, I could do it right now. Just, I don't even have to have an account. I can go in and write, you know, something really slimy. Wait, you're saying you don't have an account, Susan? No, I could not be signed in and I could make my account and I could just type whatever I want. And yeah, it, depending on the Wikipedia page, it may last that edit I made on their seconds or it might make it a day or two before somebody realizes it and removes it. But it's, right. It's and if it's, a, if it's and if it's extremely egregious by certain rules, as we know, bots now go take it out in a nanosecond. Mm -hmm. Right, There's bots it's incredible. that do that yeah. that just yeah. run and look through vandalism. They're they're used to. I have a cat right here. If you guys are wondering what I'm doing, <laughs> I, I challenged somebody to do that yesterday. I was arguing, which I shouldn't do, but I was on a site where somebody was, you know, promoting Teresa Caputo as a real psychic. And, and they were, well, I said, go look at her page. And they read the page. Oh, anyone can write anything on Wikipedia. I said, really? Go just say F you on any random page and then go back in three seconds, see if it's still there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it won't be. And, and, yeah. and we had, um, <laughs> oh, this cat is clawing my leg and I'm trying to keep my composure. <laughs> She's like, why are you not petting me more? Something about cats and my, mine, is, mine is nice and calm. See? Oh, see, see. yeah. Well, this one is one that just said, I'm here for my daily scratch, I guess. But um, um, some of the other Wikipedia pages that you've worked on are, are um, you know, people ask me often, how do you choose what you're going to work on? And you've had some very interesting pages that you've worked on that are just from your experience. You saw Science Moms explained at one of the Psycons. You went home and you wrote the Wikipedia page for it. That the science moms has been viewed i just saw it oh twenty five thousand times and if i'm not mistaken i want to thank harriet hall again for that uh that was an interesting experience yes it was the right. first icon i went to they premiered the the film i was impressed with it of course googled it and there was no wikipedia article uh so when i went home that was what i started working on and then it, there was a big argument that it should be deleted because it wasn't notable enough and uh, luckily enough, I had sat with Harriet Hall, the skeptic, 
at one of the luncheons there and we got to know each other and you know kept exchange contacts so knowing what she writes about i said hey i don't want to you know be too pushy harry but did you like the documentary would you like to review it she, oh yeah sure and within a day or two she had published you know in a reliable source you know her, her great review so it was able to add that to the page and that's probably what saved the page mm -hmm. harriet hall is great she she's yeah. done that for us many times where because harriet hall is a medical doctor who has a wikipedia page that makes her notable in the world of wikipedia so that when she writes something on her topic that she knows something about which would be medicine or anything of that sort and she writes it in a reliable place um, that has journalistic integrity the rules are a little more complicated than this but because harriet hall wrote about it with her expertise we're able to turn around and quote her and right. she's done that multiple times for us uh what the health i think she wrote about yes that was a, that was a big one later on i asked her about that because i was working on it and then she wrote something about that and that was really good to add to the page it's very good criticism mm -hmm. She's done that for us several times. And that page has an enormous amount of hits. I mean, yeah, I, I know people who what were the converted. Hell? To, yeah, That's your who, second who most viewed page you've written. Okay. Uh, 879,000 uh, views. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so so people read that before we got to it and were converted to veganism just because what's on that article, what was on that article. Actually, it was more the, the, the documentary by the same producers called Cowspiracy, which I also worked on, not to the same extent. Uh, and also had a criticism to it, but it basically was a polemic, which means it's like you know a single-minded documentary without legal balance, and it was basically you know uh, it's not fossil fuels, it's cow farts which are causing global warming, and you know if you're eating meat, it's your fault. That was the the, the gist of cowspiracy, uh, to put it simply. Is and then what the hell goes further? Cowspiracy. 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 That's correct. Instead of conspiracy, cowspiracy, and and I think the poster is like a cow with prison bars in front of it. Uh, so you know, you know, and we we have a, we have a vegan on our our team. We probably have a lot of vegans, but ones who's more outspoken, Leon, and you know he helped make that page more correct too, because you know although he'd like everyone to be a vegan out of principle, he doesn't want to unlike some other vegans, you know. Uh, the ends justify the means, and let's make lies so that we can convince people not right. to eat animals. But right. it's science of it. Right, right. And what the health is is sort of in that vein. The same producers did it, and and its mode was: if you're eating meat, you're killing yourself. Your yeah. most popular viewed page is one of the ones you've written most recently, and that was uh, you were home, like all of us, a lot of us are, um, and you were watching Netflix, and you. It was Easter time, and you turned on, and you saw this this show. Uh, it, it was Passover time, to be oh, specific, Passover, be sorry. because of the. Uh, the I think of Easter and Passover matter. is the same. Yeah. I guess they're not. Sometimes. Well, tell us about yeah. it. What was this no? Oh, well, so so. Um, somewhere or another, it was recommended in my feed uh, that there was a Netflix documentary called Unorthodox. And it was written by someone who escaped an ultra-religious uh, Hasidic Jewish community, uh, not far from where I grew up in Brooklyn. And I watched it as a very good one. I mean, everyone who's seen this that I recommended to liked it. I watched you, it. You, you watched it too. Recommended okay. it, and I don't watch a lot of TV. And, and it's not a big time. It's I think it's five or six episodes, so it's not that long. Uh, and, and so then I said, okay, let me research the author and uh, the book this is based on. And it turns out there was no Wikipedia article for the book. So that's actually the first book article I wrote, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so I wrote that, yes, I wrote that article. And also the author had like, it wasn't quite a stub, but it was nearly as bad. So I, I fixed that up dramatically. And uh, yeah, so how many views did we Deborah get on that? Feldman. How many views? So the Wikipedia page for the book, which is highly unusual because books don't get a lot of Wikipedia page views, oddly enough. I mean, I guess they get some, but compared to an author's page. So the book has been seen, you made this live on April 13th, um, 429,000 times. That's insane. I mean, that's if a book insane. gets 4,000 views, that's a year, that's a lot. Um, because most people go to Amazon or someplace else to to find out information about a book. Um, the the person whose page you rewrote, Deborah Feldman, um, it was a, a very bad shape, and you really fixed it up beautifully and uh, made it nice. 
my cat is wondering why I'm not petting her. Um, 1,364,726 uh, page views. Wow. So that's amazing because that's wow. what you're doing is you're really helping her. Oh, she, she's coming up here now because she says, your hands are above, so you must be petting me. And she is making pet hair everywhere too. So this is Imogen. That's not, Ham that's not Hamilton. That's what, what's This is Imogen, his Imogen. sister. So the point is, is that... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that uh and i can't kick her out because then I've, i'm talking to you so um she rarely comes in here at this time um is that you've made a huge improvement in not only for people to be able to understand who this author is but what it does is it boosts her up in the media i mean not like she needed more help considering she's already famous with this movie but obviously people are going to the wikipedia page to get information about her and her book it probably boosts sales um, it, it's more likely she's going to get interviews and, and, and so on. And that's what we're doing with the science community. People in the science community were, were helping out by making it more, uh, how do I say this? We're trying to make sure that people see scientists as humans and not just Ivy League, you know, they sprung out of the loins of their PhD parents or something. When we write the Wikipedia page, we're trying to do so you know, not gossipy or anything, but we want to make it so that people stumble on the Wikipedia page possibly. And people say, that's really interesting. That person yeah. grew up in the same town I grew up in and sounds like they had the same kind of upbringing I had. You mean I could be this virologist or this epidemiologist or, you know, this could be something I could achieve myself because look, this person seems relatable i can relate to this person and, I, and so it, it was tough getting information on um uh, on uh, the astronomer that way that, that yeah. really wasn't very available with thomas bob we were able to come up with all so kinds yeah of that was interesting that, that was who, who, fascinating who wrote that. i wish i knew that article, but that was very good but alan hale did not have that kind of information anywhere in a reliable source i could use uh but then so the next one i wrote of a person was bob senker so this was more of a sort of a personal Robert thing. Robert Sinker, yeah. Robert Sinker. Yeah, you can actually use Bob because everyone called him that. So there's a redirect in Wikipedia that if you just Bob Sinker, you still get that page. And so this is a shuttle astronaut who I actually worked with. Uh, you know, I didn't know him very well. So it wasn't like it was a conflict of interest to work on this at all. We hadn't talked in 30 years. But he flew on the space shuttle mission immediately before the one that blew up with Crystal McAuliffe on it. And they trained together. So he went to, you know, was devastated personally by this. He knew all those people who were on the, the, the mission that uh, ended in tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, now, Bob had a page that was like five lines long, and there was a comment on the talk that says, Why is this on here? This is not worth it. We should delete this page. And it was on there for a year, so no one had taken that seriously because the guy's an astronaut. There were only like 200 humans ever sent into space at that time. I'm sorry, you know, no. Even if, even if it's a short page, let's fix it. Don't delete it. But, you know, I went and it's it, it's actually like a really good article now. I mean, I think that's one of the ones that's literally a Wikipedia. Am I right about that? I have two good yeah. articles on Wikipedia, which is like one half of one percent of all Wikipedia articles. Which means a good article good. is 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 a I know we're saying a good article that sounds yeah. like it's a good article. No, it's, it's good. It's a good standard. article in all caps, right? It's, it's yeah. something that Wikipedia has a, a criteria. Has a hit, criteria. Yeah, a criteria. You have to yeah. hit these certain right. standards right. to be considered and many a people good review article. It. Many people review it. Deal. And they say, no, it's not good enough. you got to fix this if you want it to be a good article. Right. So I went through that. I think it was that article. But anyway, one of the, to your previous point, I tried to personalize it. Instead of just, this was the mission, this is how many orbits it went, this is the payload. I wrote a point where why this was important because it was the last mission that someone called a payload specialist flew for many, many years. The shuttle program was grounded. And even after it started flying again, many years later, they didn't let people in Bob's position fly again because he was a civilian just like me. He was just an engineer. Mm -hmm. And hey, at the time, NASA was saying, it's so safe, we could send anyone up, including a teacher, right? So this changed the culture of NASA to not allow that to happen again. So I kind of imbued the article with that important point, why his mission was important. And that kind of personalized it, I think. And yet, ironically, still, occasionally, I'll have someone come across and say, this section be taken out. What does this have to do with his, his mission? It's like, yeah, heck with you. Yeah, and so that Wikipedia page um, has, and the last name is 
C-E-N-K-E-R. Oh yeah, C-E-N-K-E-R, Bob Sinker. It's been viewed 23,000 times. Yeah, not bad for you know a not famous astronaut. Yeah, it's it, it needs to be there, and yeah. and, and he's still active, by the way. He 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 does presentations in support of NASA and the manned space program, and whenever he goes someplace, you can tell like it's been advertised, and his page will spike. Yeah, you'll not, see a not, little spike not, whenever yeah, they yeah. go. Not huge numbers, see. but it's clear it was out in some local publication. Oh, who's this astronaut? Should we go see him? And they'll look at the Wikipedia article. We get that. I I just listened to one of the UK skeptics. Um, uh, skeptics in the pub, which I would recommend you guys. It's on Thursdays, and they do a lecture once a month. And last week was Adam Rutherford, and he's one of the people we wrote a Wikipedia page for a long time ago, back in 2014. And I mentioned that on the chat, and somebody came and said, "Well, I was one of those views. I just read the Wikipedia page right before the, right before the talk." <laughs> I was like, "Well, that's that's what they do." Um, the photo arc. That was fun. That was an unusual thing. I wasn't even sure it kind of fall, fell in the purview, uh, but since it was about endangered species and, and wildlife and that sort of thing, I guess you count it. But I was going to do it anyway, just because I went to uh, a, an exhibit of the photo arc. And if people haven't heard of that, National Geographic's uh, top photographer, Joel S Satori, who also has a separate page I worked a little bit on, but there was no photo arc page. And this is the project of which the, the goal is to photograph every animal species in captivity on planet earth and he's well along in the project he's dedicated i think it's already decades of his life to it there there's been uh you know uh television documentaries on it numerous books which i keep getting from my wife for gifts uh, you know with photographs and and stories it's very fascinating and there was a local exhibit exhibition about two hours from us we went with some other friends who are into animal photography and uh, yeah, I was so like, how is there not a Wikipedia article for this? So now there is. It's, I, it's I, really great. It's it's a fun. It falls in our world because in the in the GSOW project, anything that has to do with science, scientific skepticism, or the paranormal falls in our category. So photographs of animals um, in a scientific way is definitely one of our avenues. And the photo arc Wikipedia page was published in 2018. You're about to hit 14,000 views. And I think people listening go click on the photo arc page a bunch of times so that we can get, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. get 14,000 because we're really uh, close. So, so the other the other thing that I did that was, um, you know, I don't know, I, I thought it was going to be questionable, but you liked it to, to count it as one of ours was the, the cat in space. The only I love cat. that. Oh, my gosh. It's so adorable. How do you pronounce the name? Felicit. Well, I don't know French very, you know, I think it's Felicit. First cat in space. Space. Only cat in space. Mm. You hear that, Imogen? <laughs> Hopefully you won't end up with the same tragedy happening to you. You'll get a Wikipedia page, but it won't be nice what happens to you when you're all done. Yeah, I mean, how about open that? Your head Successful look at flight. The French launched her. Comes back down. Ooh, yeah, she survived. You know, like a was a male. parades and whatever. Oh, wow. it was a female. It was no, it was a female. Yeah, there was a mistake in the popular press. In fact, they printed postage stamps claiming the name was Felix and it was a male because, you know, the news gets everything wrong. <laughs> it does. So I think I noted that on the page. But yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, successful flight only gave her three months to live because then they cut her open to examine her brain to see if and there was She was any a, the most gentle of all the cats they were trying to. Yeah. Very sad, but you know, she's got a Wikipedia page now with 215,000 page views. And the photograph I added, what does it say, Susan? You're on it? Do you read there? No, I didn't look at the no. page. So I'm something like, you know, uh, thank you for helping me participate in the space program and <laughs> something in French. <laughs> like, It's adorable. You went on to do some other really interesting things. I'm not ta talking about the, the psychic stuff yet. You are a bane of uh, Gwyneth Paltrow because... <laughs> yeah like she knows who i am but some of her fans know who i am it's interesting okay. i was a little worried because she has uh her you know her and robert downey jr because you know pepper Potts and iron man um there was a fan with a twitter account who who lambasted me for dare attacking her in an article not the wikipedia article but i wrote an article for a aipt comics um uh, science week and it was all about how bad Goop was, and um, you know, therefore Gwyneth Paltrow, and I juxtaposed her with her character Pepper Potts. 
So, you know, the, the name of the article was a pepper part, pepper pot supervillain, uh, you know, and how bad Gwyneth Paltrow and Goop are to bring bad information to the world. And her fans did not like that. At least a few of them, they were tweeting back and forth. Who is this guy? How dare he attack us? <laughs> and there were photos of these people with Gwyneth and Iron Man, you know, at some backstage event, smiling with flowers. So it's like they were really super fans. They did not like that anyone was uh, saying bad things about Gwyneth. You wrote the Goop Lab Wikipedia page when that came out on Netflix. and That was my follow-up, yeah. And it's several have, tra and it's been translated into multiple languages because GSOW works in multiple languages. And the Goop Lab has, since you produced it in January of 2020. January? This January? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Man, my time is all messed up. I would have thought yeah. that was two years ago, but I guess... Yeah, that's one of the uh, symptoms of COVID. January it disagrees with your time sense. Yeah. yeah, January 2020 does feel like about two years ago. Yeah. So the Goop Lab Wikipedia page in English has been 195,000 times since you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, a, I, I did a lecture once, I, Rob, oh, a few years ago, and I had written down on a little post-it, you know, how many views we had our, our GSW project had done up to that date. And it was... And I, I got up and I was lecturing at the end of the lecture. Oh, hold on. My cat's going to lay on my computer. Who knows what it's going to do? <laughs> Type on something. It's going to kill the, the stream. <laughs> the stream will... um, so I had written down and I, and I just remembered a nice round number. And I got up and I said, oh, and our Wikipedia pages have been viewed 10 million times. And then I paused. I said, wait, that doesn't seem right. Maybe it's, maybe it's. A no, is it a hundred thousand times? Maybe it's only a hundred thousand times. Can't million. be ten million. Seem right, and I and I just blinked. And what is and the team up to now? Sixty. Sixty something million. No, no, no. Sixty-six million eight hundred thirty-eight thousand one hundred sixty-six page views, and yeah. I just checked sixty-six million. But I said to myself, ten million just doesn't sound right. It must be a hundred thousand. And I went back and I looked. I'm like. Oh my God! It's ten million. I mean, it really is ten million. Yeah, I, I, I had a sl slide in my project. Website. I started just on like less well, than ten years ago. Less than ten years ago, and and of course the numbers of uh, editors initially weren't very high. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah, actually, it's funny because I actually put a slide in about how many people look at the main page on Wikipedia. Right. And the number is like 99 billion or something. It's like, wait a minute, am I reading that right? It's like, you know, uh, an order of magnitude 10 times more than people on planet Earth. <laughs> it's like, well, of course, that's not everyone reads it, but many people read it all the time. So that's how you get a number like that. But Some yeah. people just go to the front page of Wikipedia every yeah. day. That's like their main page. And they go and they look Which is interesting. I day. never do. Oh, do I, never, the day. I do a little more now that I've had the, the do you know publications but before that i didn't even know it existed it was not something i ever did so I'm, I'm actually surprised it gets that wide of a viewing yeah my bookmark is my watch list so okay. when i turn it on it goes right to my watch list i never go to the wikipedia page that has all the you know languages or right but some people do they type in wikipedia.org and they get the front pages of these things yeah. and so it gets a lot of views the <laughs> so let's talk i'm sorry guys there's just cat hair i i want to ask you about weather pains and we're talking pains as in p-a-i-n-s what the heck was weather pains which has been viewed fifty-one thousand times already since you yeah so, so that's a that's a widely held 16. that's a widely held belief and there might even be people watching this now or in the future who are gonna say i'm full of crap when i say this <laughs> but there's no science to the belief that changing weather makes people feel one way or the other i mean not mood wise we're talking that's obvious yeah it's true you get depressed or whatever if it's cloudy all the time people like a nice sunny day but i'm talking about people who feel joint pains and arthritis quote unquote flaring up and, and even worse things migraines come and go and there's absolutely no scientific backing to that so you know initially the page pretty much was leaning well we don't understand this but it's probably true to now hopefully it still is the way i, I changed it which has had the scientific evidence that there's no really evidence for this so uh, yeah. before we get to the psychic work you've done, let's, I have one more to mention. Look at Mark is bringing me a cookie. Nice. Uh, Can I have a cookie? Uh, how are you? How are you? Hey, I plugged your book. You might, you might get another, another sale out of it. Wait, you did what? You plugged my book? Yeah, I, was, I just mentioned it. 
yeah. Cool. We were talking. We were talking about book sales and how how few books actually sell compared to how many articles get read on Wikipedia. So actually, I, I, again, I, I used yours as a real example of a book that is out there in the real world. It's on, uh, you know, it's not a fiction. It's a, it's a nonfiction book. And it's also an audio book now. And it's, that's right. I didn't, forgot to mention that. Which is even better than the, I think, than the written book. Because, you, because it has update, it's updated, right? Well, no, when I took it to the publisher, he, they edited about a third out. The parts that made me seem a little human. right they wanted right. the character to be really dark and nasty and it comes off that way so yeah i, I the read the book initially and i said wait i had met mark he didn't seem like that i know <laughs> that's because the good the lighter stuff got taken out so now when i read the book for audiobooks i put all that back in yeah i, I listened to that too I thought it was so long ago i read the book i didn't for sure remember the changes but frankly well, i just thought you had, i thought, I thought I thought you had mellowed over time because you were older than when you wrote the book. I yeah, well, that's probably <laughs> true. I'm not quite as villainous as I once was. So, so Mark, Mark actually gave me an interview for Skeptical. We haven't talked about that yet. My articles for Skeptical Inquirer, but Mark is one of the uh, earlier people that I interviewed uh, for for the magazine, and that was interesting. I, we talked about his wisdom. book. Yeah. Great wisdom. <laughs> I, I had my wisdom teeth taken out. <laughs> That's Mark Edward, everybody. Hi, everybody. Mentalist my, extraordinaire. My Brian Dunning t-shirt on. Can you Skeptoid. understand what com. it means? Uh, science is greater than superstition? Close. Science is greater than pseudoscience. Or paranormal. Okay. okay. You great? guys go on. I'll see you later. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. You never know who might show up in a COVID household like mine. We have had nobody here practically at all, and I like it just like that. Just the cats, Mark Edward and I. So, so, so we're talking all about my articles, and one of the reasons that, that I, you know, I, I thought it would be a good idea to do this was to get. You know, I don't know how many people are watching now, but certainly it'll be on the web, and okay. anybody can watch it later. But one of the reasons would be to get people to realize that you know, the, without any skills in this area, I'm not a paranormal investigator, didn't have any background in this, and yet. You know, by joining the Guerrilla Skeptics team, I was able to make uh, amazing, uh, still to me, the number of contribution to people finding out the truth and hopefully, you know, educating the world, as we say, or educating the world while, while we sleep. And we can uh, change in, in your, we can so, train, so, you know, train anybody. Yeah. So, yeah, right. So you just, you just, you don't have to be a computer whiz. You don't have to be a literary genius. You know, my background's in engineering. It's not, it's not uh, literary at all, but people can do this. And, you know, even, even small contributions grow to be big with the power of Wikipedia. So, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. And in my case, it, it was kind of happenstance that I went on to actually do some more stuff. Um, I would have been happy just doing the Wikipedia. But when I went to my first conference, it was like I was so enthralled with all the influence that these people had and the, what they were doing that I felt I wanted to do even more. And luckily, I was able to do that by getting uh, the columnist position with Skeptical Inquirer. Whereas the columns that you're writing for Skeptical Inquirer, because it's being written for a, a reliable source, those are able to now be used on Wikipedia pages. So when you yeah, interview and, somebody, and, and, yeah, it yeah, can't yeah. it can't be used as the reason why a person gets a Wikipedia page. Right. But it can be used as backup, as in when you interview somebody on Skeptical Inquirer and you publish it, then it's like, you know, what whatever is just like the body of the article, like maybe who they were influenced by, the questions you ask, or maybe where they grew up, or, you know, more personal information that we right. wouldn't normally be able to find in a lot of other places. So it's extremely right. helpful for you to be able to do that. Plus they're interesting interviews. I mean, right. Bob Nygar has a Wikipedia page. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about it. You, you interviewed him and that was a fascinating discussion. Isn't he that. interesting? He's so interesting. And he so had my, my, only wonderful things to say about you. He said that because of the Wikipedia page you wrote, he's getting more gigs and people are taking him more I, I'm service. still waiting for the bucks to pay back. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 yeah, yeah so, so that's an interesting story. I'll try to make it short. I've actually told this in the beginning of my What's the Harm of Believing in Psychics presentation. Is, and this is an interesting thing of uh, synergy in the psychic community. Um, Derek, uh, how do you say his last name? Psychic community or the skeptic? Skeptic, sorry. Colin Duno. Derek, Derek Colin Duno. Duno, who did and hopefully will do again skepticality, interviewed Bob Nygaard, the private eye, 
on his podcast and I, and I heard that and I was, wow, this is amazing. So Bob Nygaard you know, investigates psychic fraud, helps victims get their money back, helps put these people in prison. And I had never heard of him. And of course, being a GSOW person, I go home and let's look him up on Wikipedia. And there was no article. Uh, but there were plenty of newspaper reports where he was interviewed or people talked about his cases. So this person is definitely Wikipedia notable. And I wrote an article, uh, you know, with no question that worry was going to be deleted. And certainly there was no challenge at all. And, and But now it's interesting because if you do psychic fraud detective, you get his page, right? And it has, and I made sure of this, all of his most famous cases, how gullible people were taken to the bank. And hopefully, you know, somebody looks at that questioning, oh, should I go see the psychic down the corner? And it might give them pause. You know, that was kind of the point, mm -hmm. not necessarily to give Bob more work, but because <laughs> he has more work than he can handle. I don't know if he said it in the interview, but he told me he gets four or five a day people contacting wow, him. that many? Yeah. And he's a single person. He's not an agency. You know, he's as busy as he possibly can be. And it's, it's sad. I was personally contacted by a woman who found my email address because of the article I wrote about Bob Nygaard for actually Skeptical Inquirer. Uh, when, I, when I wrote the article for Wikipedia, it's anonymous. But once I became a columnist, I interviewed him for Skeptical Inquirer, did an interview article, wrote two in fact. And since that's associated with my contact information, people could Google psychic fraud and my email pops up. So I would get emails which tore, you know, tore at my heartstrings. It's like, help me, please. I've lost my entire life savings to a psychic car artist. They attached the documentation from, from the, um, the records they filed with their legal authorities. And, you know, there's nothing I can do. They're saying it's not a legal, it's not a criminal case. I have to sue them in as a private court and I can't even afford a lawyer. And, you know, all I could do was send it to Bob Nygaard and I don't know, I don't think I could take this case, you know. Bob's like and, added to the list, you know. How added many? to the list of people who are being suckered. It, I, it's just, it must be an enormous amount of people all the time. And I'm sure it's not just limited to the United States. Oh, um, yeah. Absolutely not. I just read that right. book. Um, uh, I actually finished a book that was uh, suggested at PsychOn because it won the Bales um, Award oh. for Literature. It's about uh, the um, Maria Duval. Yeah, I had never heard of that. That's fascinating. I, I'd heard of it, and oh, some CNN reporters investigated it, and they wrote a book about it. And oh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's not billions of dollars have been wasted on that and, and yeah. spent on it. And so this is part of this is what I talk about when I do these presentations on what's the harm in believing in psychics. And recently, we've had you know this blowback from Teresa Caputo fans. What's why? Why are you bothering? It's just there. She's helping people, and she's a good person, and there's nothing harmful that can come of this. Well, no, you people don't realize the shit you're getting in, mm -hmm. into. If you believe this enough, you will go to because you can't get a reading from Teresa Caputo easily. You might go to Betsy Jones on the corner, and she might be one of these people who will, because you're already a believer, will mm -hmm. have her claws into you and will take mm -hmm. you for your life savings. Absolutely. That's the harm, and you it's not it. just it's not a slippery slope fallacy. And clearly, I'm not saying it will happen to everyone, but it happens to a lot of people. And if we could just convince more people that this isn't real to begin with, there would be less victims for these people to latch on to. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> the the flying spaghetti monster. May you be touched by his noodly appendage. Touched by his noodly appendage. And you have written, and this is something that I, I just appeared on Squaring the Strange podcast. It hasn't been released yet, but we were talking about psychic detectives and um, psychics and so on. And this is one of my banes with the skeptic community is for so long, or just in the community at whole, people want to do something to fight against, let's use psychics, because that's my thing. Um, and they, they do these things like they write academic articles. Well, not necessarily about psychics, but, you know, about medical things. They write an academic article who's going to be read by who, you know, <laughs> other academics who probably wouldn't have fallen for it in the first place. You know, you get... 100 views 100 people read it you know it's just not used it's not read that much or uh the skeptic community tries to do something and they write this report this evaluation about a person and it it goes to the choir we all go wow that was great or very rarely people write a, a report up on an investigation that they have done into a psychic and again it gets put around the facebook and the twitter and people high five each other and great job but it's not affecting the people that should be affecting. 
Mark Edward has talked about this for years, that you have to get back to the psychic on the stage. You need to make them feel uncomfortable. You need to make sure that they know that they're being watched. You need to make them feel like they don't know who in that audience is there who could be there to sting them. They don't know if the private reading they're doing is with a, a skeptic who's videotaping or recording the whole thing and is going to release this article and it's got a bunch of fake information on Facebook. They don't know because we're not psychic. But they don't know, and you have to make them uncomfortable so that they don't take the risks they normally might have taken. They may not take on as many gigs. They may, you know, we know there's several people who have kind of stopped touring. Uh, I know Chip Coffee's pretty much stopped touring. He hasn't come to California since we stung him twice with uh, Operation um, Bumblebee. And it's all on his Wikipedia page for and people to find all, easily. So that's where we miss the step. We go up to the to write to that area to writing these articles and reliable sources, and it stays there. And what GSOW has done is we've taken it from the skeptic community and put it in a place where it's read by millions of people. They can't the psychics can't do anything about it. I hear that all the time. People will, did you ask their permission? Yeah, Jeanette Wilson <laughs> tried to. Want to tell that story? Who? Which one? Jeanette Wilson. Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. Well, hold on. Let me see if I can get there. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So basically she's a, a UK <laughs> psychic living in New Zealand and she stumbled upon her page, which basically had all the criticism from the good thinking society and whatever that she's a fraud. She actually claims to do psychic surgery on people, not the old fashioned kind that James Randi debunked by sticking your hand into somebody's body and, you know, pulling out chicken guts uh deceptively and saying it's a tumor but she channels actual dead doctors and surgeons who give her the psychic power to heal somebody uh, it's despicable so you know her wikipedia page you know had all this criticism on it and she stumbled upon it made an account with her own name no and, she you know, didn't use her own name oh was what was it I thought one, it was. One, one. okay so i thought i remember Jeanette wilson okay so so and then she she deletes the entire you know, everything but basically the basic bio. So, but then she went to talk and said, didn't she say I'm Jean Jeanette Wilson and use her name? Well, she, and did, say, she did, she did, she did reveal herself, but she didn't go to talk for a while. She was just deleting right. stuff. Yeah, and then and she went to the- The editors came in and said, what the right. hell are you doing? Right, You can't right. do that. No, I'm right. Jeanette Wilson. These are right. all lies. Right, right. <laughs> of course, it immediately went back and, you know, we said, tough, you know, th these are reputable sources and your say-so doesn't matter here. And yeah, she was furious. She then went to the Wikipedia committee. I, I guess that's still pending. Just, you know, to basically, she upped it up a level that, that you, they can't say this. This is slander. <laughs> it's not slander. It's just the truth. Yeah. She, does, so, she doesn't it, like it. And it caused me to do a sting on her called Operation Purple Pinecone Pie. And that just came out in April or so. I haven't even written it up, but I have been talking about it in different podcasts. I will eventually write that up as an article. But I was able to, to use the information I had gained and went to the media in New Zealand and said, hey, this person's, you know, spreading COVID uh, treatments. This person says she's treating people. She's anti-5G. She's anti-vaccine. <laughs> on and on. And so the media in New Zealand interviewed her and said, you know, Somebody attended your your uh, workshop the other day, and and they were saying that you were anti vaccine and you were anti mammogram, anti five G, and she says absolutely not. They have it all incorrect. There's no way I would have said that. And he goes, well, I just watched the video of you doing that. <laughs> <laughs> She's all video. I don't somebody taking video in there. Well, somebody did, and so <laughs> that was me. So he was able to write an article about it, and he puts in the article that she said that it wasn't that she hadn't done it and then when he said well you're i watched the video on it she was like well i i'm not anti-vaccine god provides all the vaccines and so you know it's okay. he's not he's not doing a good job of getting the herd immunity not all saying that. no so yeah. so so we then were able to put all that information from these articles that were being written about her now onto the Wikipedia page because they're in reliable sources and you know factual and you can double check it and they have journalistic integrity. Kenny Biddle, we mentioned a few times, he he was a sweetheart because she had made a bunch of claims about uh, ghost photography. Ghost. The most elementary, ridiculous photographs she was showing in this uh, web webinar I attended as real and I 
And I was like, this is so silly. I mean, to me- Clearly a ghost. Yeah, people, uh, people maybe it's just it. a camera strap in front of the lens. No, <laughs> it's so clearly a ghost. Kenny, There's no other explanation. of his heart wrote a very good, I mean, a really good article about um, the ghost photography angle, which then goes onto her Wikipedia page because it's published and reliable. So, so this is a, a cycle that at, up until like maybe five years ago, the skeptic community wasn't even thinking about to get these onto a Wikipedia page. It just wasn't even occurring to them. So I feel like now we have a fighting chance to take some of the pseudoscience down because not only are there fans reading these Wikipedia pages, but the people who are curious about them and who haven't really made up their mind. And the media is reading these Wikipedia pages and turning around and quoting what's on the Wikipedia pages. That's an important people. point. And it's right. just not it's like the ultimate way of fighting back and not just psychics vaccines cancer clinics cancer clinics you know um all sorts yeah. of pseudoscience Real dangerous of medical stuff. Yeah. and then we translate it into languages that are not just english so that other people can can experience this we have a few comments that i probably have just been ignoring sorry you guys i was looking at stat badger kenny biddle is calling himself ghost killer Hey, Kenny. Uh, uh, Mr. Awesome. And and Janice Boynton points out that, you know, the way, how I'm talking about um, skepticism and how we go into from from writing the article to getting it onto Wikipedia. She says uh, skeptics just aren't necessarily activists in that way. But if you're going we need more that activists. far to writing an article about it, then let's bring it to the attention of somebody who can get it on Wikipedia. Robin Canton was saying that your pronunciation of the cat, the French cat was perfect and that he <laughs> liked Wait, the picture. Mine or yours when you said yours? I didn't say it. I, I intentionally haven't said it. I'm saying that cat that you wrote a Wikipedia page that went up in space. <laughs> I'm intentionally uh, yeah. not. That I am cat. notorious for un, being unable to pronounce words. That, no, I haven't heard that anywhere. Oh my gosh, it's probably on my Wikipedia page. I cannot pronounce anything in Spanish. Yeah, where, where is that Richard Saunders from? Richard Saunders? Yeah, where's he from? He's from Australia. Australia. Australia? No, I didn't say Australia. I said Australia. You did better than you normally do there. Well, it's Washington <laughs> I have a problem with. Anything yes, the Washington. The other one. And everybody I was going to say who's the first president. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't see all the comments, you guys. I can only see like the last five. Sorry. if you. And I see there's 21 comments. I haven't read them all, but. We've already answered it. I'm sure we've gotten to those questions. Let's go. Let's go to some of the other things we were going to talk about. Um, what were we going to talk about? Your your thoughts on psychics? Um, well, I, I, I think uh, you mentioned something about the uh, well known skeptic where that comes from. So oh, I don't yeah, know if I, I've ever said skeptic. that anywhere specifically, except on my Facebook page, the well known skeptic. By the way, if anyone wants to like it, uh, but I do have a little intro as to where that comes from especially as i said in the beginning because people are you're not well known how dare you call yourself that i say well okay bill nye wasn't the science guy either he was an engineer so you know <laughs> I, can, I can have some leeway there well but he's turned anyway. into a science guy yeah you actually know, he doesn't have a actually in the story of his that moniker is similar to mine as it turns out oh really i, I don't know if you know the story no uh, and i talked to bill nye at the the Psychon last time, and I, I did not know this at the time. Otherwise, I would have mentioned it in passing as something funny. But I read his article after I met him and talked to him, and it, and it's on his Wikipedia article. He was on a television show as a, he wasn't famous yet. He was just a guest as an engineer to show something, and the host of the show said something that Bill and I then corrected the science of, and he said turns to him and goes, "What the hell are you, Bill Nye, the science guy?" Oh, that's how he got his. That's how he got his name. At least that's what it says on Wikipedia. So, so well, it sounds uh, right. It, it kind of rhymes. So yeah, so it was, I, it was clever, I, and yeah. he he went with it. So so when I got uh, so I wrote an article about the Gorilla Skeptics and submitted it uh, unrequested to the Skeptical Inquirer, the magazine which turned me into a skeptic many decades ago, and I was shocked that they actually printed it and. <laughs> Not only that, but a week after it was published, the editor, Ben Radford, uh, also you know one of my skeptical heroes for all the paranormal investigations and on books he's written, calls me and says, hey, you want a job you know, to be an on-staff columnist? And I was like, 
uh, who is this? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Who's tricking uh, me? Like, is this Glyph like, again? Like, oh, what? <laughs> it's like what? And and uh, and you're going to pay me to write? Like what? <laughs> it's like I never envisioned this as part of my uh, career. Um, but you know, right after I, I in three seconds said yes, uh, it was like okay, uh, now I need a column name. What do I do? And it had turned out that just a few months earlier. I had sent in a, um, a, a who, who's that noisy to the skeptics guide to the universe. That's a segment for those who don't watch it. You should, uh, that listen to the podcast. They have a segment where a, a sound is played generally by Jay Novella and it's sent in by somebody and then people have to guess what it is. And then it gives you a week and you know, he reads who was, the, who got it right. And so I sent in a sound, um, sometime in January and they played it February sometime around that that vein and I was shocked that when they introduced it like he normally would say hey this is from this is from uh one of our fans named Bill and this but he goes uh this sound is sent in by uh Rob Palmer who uh you know him right Steve yeah he's a well-known skeptic so I was like, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> so there you go. It's like that, we've cleared that up. So now that everybody knows that's where that comes from. I was a little so, distracted, Rob, while you were talking because I was watching the parade of cats walking behind you. <laughs> you have a very fluffy cat that did a loop. It like, came Mr. out of the screen, walked on the other side, very slowly, very slowly, <laughs> walking, strunting along, very fluffy, walked around the couch came out that one's still there yeah so it wasn't that one no no it wasn't that one no i know it was misty and, she's the fluffy and she one. came around the couch all the way and she went over to your 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 cabinet there the black cabinet and stared at it for quite a long time smelling one of the drawers i don't know if that's where you keep your catnip or not but she stood there smelling it for, that's funny for a no, while i, I thought is she gonna that. disappear is there like a little trap door she pushes the button and the she actually does in. that's it's open it in sometimes she crawls in there to investigate that would have been funny if she did that <laughs> well if the door had been open she probably would have gotten in there so no, we, it's open it's actually open in the center so she right, right she oh i can't tell it just looks black no, right yeah. there. so it's she was simple. looking in there at, <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't tell uh we have a comment from paula she says she's talking about paul uh uh the Paula, line. Paula, Paula who? No, this is Paula, Paula Lauterbach. Oh, I'm not supposed to say that. Online. Paula what? Paula, Paulinda Lawrence. Paulinda. Know? Yeah, Paulinda. Oh my gosh. I always call her Paulinda because I know another Paula and I can't do Yeah, that. no, no. It's, I wish she would change her name. Paula, Linda. He was great as Speedwalker on Almost Live, oh, Almost Live. Oh, Almost Live. It's got an exclamation point comedy tv show from seattle before his own show so oh that might have been it then bill bill nye the science he probably guy. says that on the page probably does we didn't write his wikipedia page but we did write or rewrite the wikipedia page bill nye the science guy which is a whole different wikipedia page i guess it's about the show about the show very cool yeah I we rewrote that. that because he was starting to get fame again and uh, what we try to do is we try to write wikipedia pages about things that are about to become popular but they have to be at a certain they have to have enough notoriety to get a wikipedia page and then then we try to get there right at that sweet spot and then get it right before it becomes uber famous so so the people who who are you know like starting to be interested in a topic will have something to look at when they go to look at it right. and it's a sweet spot you know, uh, several of the people follow things that happen on their Facebook feed. I know uh, Robin Canton, who I mentioned earlier, he's mentioned several things that come up alternative medicine wise that come up on his Facebook feed. Autism, um, I guess there's algorithms in, in Facebook, just, or I don't know if it's still happening, that like if you start looking on certain Wikipedia, uh, certain Facebook pages, they suggest more of that type. And so I think he's been looking at a lot of anti-vaccine pages and he kept getting suggested more. And so he's been doing a lot of writing about vaccines. Um, the uh, I had Paul off and I did an interview like I'm doing with you here. It's so cool, huh? You're being interviewed on the same same um, channel as Dr. Uh, Paul Offit. Offit. Wow. Well, I know Paul Offit was saying the same thing. He says, well, I'm following Rob Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. The well-known skeptic. Sure. <laughs> Paul Offit was saying that, um, you know, my belief is that 
in the world we're living in right now, all the, all the pushback the science community has received on vaccines for years and years and years is about to become a tsunami. Yeah, we, yeah. we get closer I'm to the, creating a vaccine, that, yeah. it's going to become, I mean, who would think we'd be fighting over masks? I mean, that's just so silly. insane. It is insane. But so he said that, I said, we really kind of need more editors. Anybody out there listening? Anybody out there listening? Oh, oh, Paula Serrano is watching too. She says, yeah, Paula needs to change her real name. There can't be two of us. <laughs> yes, Paula. <laughs> and Paulinda says, yeah, the universe would implode if there was. <laughs> but um, the, <laughs> the idea is, is that, hi, both of you, Paulas. Um, the, the idea is that we have a sweet spot in time right now, I think, before we get to a vaccine, maybe, you know, maybe by, maybe by November or so, before we get close enough to where this vaccine is or vaccines. That sounds a little early. I actually heard Fauci talking just the, uh, the other day. He was being interviewed on, uh, um, live, uh, who was it? Oh, Facebook. Uh, yeah, he was, on, he was on Facebook by, I'm having a, uh, Fart. senior moment yes yeah, uh what's who, who runs facebook zuckerberg zuckerberg yes. yes he interviewed him a very long interview and they that one of the pieces they talked about was when is a vaccine going to be available and he was way more optimistic than i thought was possible he talked about one vaccine going into phase three trials i believe it's the end of this month another one scheduled for august and and it could very well be just after the first of the year well first that's one. what i heard January, and, February. and the best thing i heard i didn't know those hear this anywhere before was that at least that first one maybe the other ones too are being produced now on risk mm -hmm. financial risk for the companies mm -hmm. uh so you know because normally what you would do is you'd wait till the, the, the trials are all done and then you'd ramp up production but that might be months and months and months so this way if they work they originally could ship them so that is fantastic yeah, I heard January, February too. And that's kind of where I'm going yeah. with this February now. Not that I have any superior knowledge. Paul Offit yeah. says that there will be multiple vaccines probably. And, and they got to get this so we can get back to doing conferences. Time. I know. Well, we'll talk about conferences in a second, but the, but I have that on my notes. But um, I'm thinking that by November is where we're really going to hear the, the it's going to escalate the talk the about push back, the pushback. Even the more so than we're hearing now. Because I think that when we get into November, December, the idea that we are really close in yeah, January, yeah. February is going to really hit the hit. I mean, you hear it now, but I mean, massively yeah. more. I'm talking tsunami. So I feel like we have a sweet spot of time to get these Wikipedia pages written, really well written, and to get them uh, great information, and not only about the, the, the vaccines or the uh, the, the companies that are manufacturing them, but the virologists, anybody who has anything to do with vaccines and the anti-vaccine groups. And that's what Rob, um, not Rob, Robin, yeah, Robin Canton has been really focusing on is these anti-vax groups who appear to be vaccine groups because their name is yeah. uh, Vaccine Health uh, Canada. It's, it's very du like that. duplicitous. Vaccine so, Choice, you know. Vaccine Choice. Uh, so they're gonna, uh, children's Children's, children's choice. Health Network. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, different things like that. So we've got to get those Wikipedia pages really well written and established now so that when they become, who knows what's going to happen to them, the media will be able to Google them and get the Wikipedia page and go, oh, I don't think I'm going to interview those people. They're anti-vax. I didn't realize that, but now I can see that and it's there. I hope the media and, doesn't start giving them like equal time. You know? Well, the media will thinking, but I think the vaccines are kind of that area of a line in the sand that they might not, especially as we get closer. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Paula, I want to make sure I remind everybody who's watching. Thank you, Paula. Paula, Paula, Paula. That we have to please subscribe to the About Time Project YouTube channel. She put it in the Facebook notes. And if you're watching this video on YouTube, you're already there. Please subscribe to our channel. We have we just started this channel just a few months ago when I started doing these talks. Uh, if we can get to 100 subscribers, which believe it or not, we're only at like maybe 76. <laughs> if we can get 100 subscribers, then we have the ability to be able to do more with the channel we can change our we can change the string on the url to an actual personal name instead of a random string of, of numbers and letters i didn't know that either but if it, it'll help people to be able to search for about time project on youtube i mean there's all these things i didn't know but if they subscribe then we can do more if we can get to a thousand subscribe, viewers, people 
Yeah, so subscribe. If we can get to a thousand subscribers on our channel, then we can actually put a donate button on there. We do have a donate button on our About Time website, and we appreciate that. We also have been trying to get a website uh, donate button on Facebook, and there's so many things to to jump hoops to jump through, and it's like learning for me. I'm I'm not sure now. If we were a church, no problem. A couple months your nonprofit's done it's been two years so before i get to your work isn't that a holy relic behind you on, on, over your left shoulder yeah i think i think maybe you could declare a church <laughs> the church of about time so before we get to your work you've been doing with the with the 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 helpline you've been working on which i'm really interested in hearing about as we're getting close to time it goes fast on here i'm telling you it's like Ching! when you said yesterday how could i possibly have talked to psychic for three hours i'm like it was supposed to be half an hour but the next thing you know i'm like oh my gosh it's just the way it is sorry guys you just the way it is so i want to talk about con conferences because i'm really 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 big on conferences i think conferences are such a big freaking deal yeah, yeah. I, I i i was really uh, i was on your team you for the first year and i skipped it and i'm not really a very gregarious person normally at least about people i don't know so that you know my wife wasn't going to come with me so that was going to be very weird doing it uh, on my own but the second year i said okay uh, i have to do this so i i did i did go and uh, it was amazing and you listened and to me didn't you i did listen to you i, I mean i highly you know it, it's sad we can't do it right now hopefully We'll get a vaccine it more next and year. soon that'll be okay. It's important but, that you 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 yeah. go early, you stay as late as you can, like the Monday morning after. Yeah. Monday. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, but so so the different. All right, so I, I signed up for Nexus, by the way, which is a an all too. live streaming event for almost no money, which is amazing. I'm curious uh, what that's going to be like. Uh, Psycon is going to be having speakers do their stuff for free. Uh, you know, not at one time frame like Nexus is going to do it as if it was really happening on the weekend. Uh, Psycon's going to do it for many months, I guess. With the same speakers who were going to go, so that's nice. But it, there really isn't anything like you know meeting people and um, you know. What did, what did they say for financial stuff? Your experience may vary, but it was quite astounding when I went. And maybe partly it was because I was with Susan, who <laughs> like, you know, knows everybody and is the queen bee and was able to introduce people around. And I could also say to people, hey, I'm on the Gorilla Skeptics team with Susan Garbick, that like I met, you know, people I never dreamed of meeting. I was a fan of podcasting and a, actually atheist activism and skeptical activism from home and i knew all these names but i never thought i'd meet these people and i wound up having you know chats in bars and going to lunch and breakfast with people like from the skeptics guide to the universe and and um, brian dunning um, mark edward uh, richard saunders from one of my favorite podcasts that was astounding as i said i sat with harriet hall and we made a connection there um and and i had a 10 minute conversation all alone in the corner of a room with Richard Dawkins, you know, and that was like, never would have thought that would happen in my life. <laughs> and that was a little I have odd pictures. Too. I have proof. I saw you talking to him. I took pictures. Yeah. I, he was like, what do you do for a living? And I told him, uh, I work in a, you know, aerospace company for defense contractor. And actually for some reason I thought to bring it up that, and you can't believe the crazy people I work with. So I talked about this, you know, they believe in alien abductions and, and, poltergeists and you know out-of-body experiences and alien bases on the moon and all that kind of and he said you need to write a paper about that and that's actually the first time i ever thought of writing anything just richard dawkins really? just told me to write a paper and he said it send it to the richard dawkins foundation so he was like kind of serious and wow and that and that actually led me to having the guts to write the gsow article months later and send it in so that's weird that i did that yeah. And then, as I mentioned, I've met Bill Nye at a future conference. We had a conversation about Mars colonization. I just, you know, asked him about it. Of course, I met like people like James Randi and other podcasters, uh, Ross Blotcher, Vono, Ross and Carrie, Celestia Ward. Then I met YouTubers that I was familiar with, like Thomas Westbrook and uh, Drew McCoy, who's the genetically modified skeptic. And it's just amazing. Uh, the Psy the Psy Babe, we hung out. It's just freaking amazing. The difference when you go to a conference how many people you can like talk to and meet that you would never think would happen and people so, are people are just as excited to me too and that's the cool well, thing about, about it is, that but they were certainly friendly so well I, i'm also i'm saying you also in a bit of a generic sense is that people are interested in meeting other people especially fans oh they love to meet people who write wikipedia articles 
trust yeah. me. Yeah, so that, defi <laughs> that definitely helps. I mean, oh I got, hey, my I'm gosh, that, that, that oh. breaks a lot of yeah. the, <laughs> that breaks you a lot of the articles. Yeah. Let me have 10 minutes of your time. <laughs> It, but, but 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 the piece de resist de resistance is if I said that right in French is um, you know that that the, by the time I went to my second conference I would I, I had the column at Skeptical Inquirer which now lets me say hey I'm a Skeptical Inquirer author which is the magazine of this conference I'd like to talk to you so that was can really I interview cool. you yeah you know that was really cool yeah so you know I got I got to interview so many people that way. That, that's it, just amazing. It, just amazing. You know, anybody out there who's watching this is going, well, Rob Palmer is an exception to the rule. He's obviously nah, he's a very said. smart and friendly guy, but he might be the exception to the rule in some cases. We're all unique, and he, he's obviously a unique and interesting person, but I run into this experience all the time. Um, you know, when you go to these conferences, I've been to conferences since 2014, I think, uh, in Vegas, and um, PsyCon started up in Vegas just like five years ago or something like that after the amazing meeting ended. And it's always the same. You, you, especially when you're in one of these casinos, and this is the benefit of uh, the PsyCons being held in a casino is that you're mostly all staying in that, that casino and nobody has to drink and drive. I mean, nobody has to drive anywhere. So if you do drink, <laughs> you could actually have a drink there. You don't have to be like, oh, sorry, I can't have anything or I got to go home early. Just don't. But, Drink and play the tables. That's okay. Or just don't drink and say something stupid because we're all filming, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, you what think happens you can play Vegas, the guitar no and you can't sing? You better yeah. be careful because somebody's recording it. And it's going to go up somewhere. But <laughs> my point is, is that when you go to these conferences and you don't know somebody, well, first go to the Facebook page for the event. There's probably a Facebook page event. Um, I know I've been helping run the Psycon one. And say, hey, I don't know anybody, you know, and what will happen is people will go, I don't know anybody either. I don't know anybody either. When are you arriving? And people will try to share taxis from the airport to the to the event. I always suggest arriving early. I get there on Tuesday. I think this year, well, 2021, I'll probably arrive on Monday because we're doing that. Um, I'm going to invite more kids from the scholarships, uh, scholarships and then send people oh, to yeah, the school to do lectures to the school in Vegas. Speaking of uh, rides from the airport, Paulinda, Paula, picked me up uh, once. Thank you. Thank you again. Paulinda picked you up at the airport. She picked Ooh, me up at the airport. Picked, she picked him up. And but Kenny Biddle did it the next year. <laughs> yeah, people will pick you up. Or if you, I've met several people where I've gone to the bus to take over and there's people just hanging out and you're like, you must be one of the people in our event. You know, they've got some nerdy shirt on or something like that. And you're like, I bet you're part of it. And I always would take a picture of the first person. I don't know them. They don't know me. And um, <laughs> Paula says she can't imagine anyone doing something like that. I'm not sure what she's talking about. Uh, yeah. Paula Serrano? Yeah. She so, yeah. So, so, so one of the other cool things I got to do my second PsyCon was I volunteered. I don't know what came over me, but I volunteered to interview scientists and speakers there for the Skeptic Zone. And that Richard Saunders great. said, yeah, go for it, because he couldn't come that year. And that was a blast. I mean, I, I spent more really time. Thank you. I spent more time, you know, thinking of what I was going to ask these people and tracking them down and doing it than I pr pretty much did anything else that that conference. Um, and one of the interviewers that wound up being on the Skeptic Zone was of Paula Serrano. And, you know, it's like, okay, why did I interview Paula? She's not a speaker, uh, but she had a fascinating story, which I knew before. Came from Argentina. You know? Yeah, I was like, I felt awkward, um, you know, in my uh, late 50s, shall we say, going, you know, across as a guy, going across country to a place I don't know anybody, but this is a woman, younger, who travels from a Spanish-speaking country to America, you know, all by herself. It's like, I, I was like, I thought that was a freaking one of the gutsiest things I've ever heard of. And plus, she had a fascinating reason for being there. She, and, and this gets, I'm repeating what she said in the interview, but, you know, the short version is she had done the uh, English to Spanish translation on An Honest Liar, the documentary about James Randi, and like fell in love with a guy at the time. And she went to Tam just to see him. It's like, it's like, that's astounding. She didn't know anybody. And, and Argentina and, by herself. And, and She's by herself person. to do that. And then she got like the first thing off the bat, as I recall, sit on a couch and talk to James Randi. It's like, and she's cool. one of our GSOW editors. And she is. 
Yes. Yeah, in fact, she sat in the seat to uh, to learn the the ropes of uh, editing. You finally got her to. I finally I finally got her to visit her and uh, on her American trip, and we we that's what we did. We got her past your difficult hurdles of uh, graduation. Everybody wants you to finish your training. Janice Boynton said that Susan and Rob were the first two people I met at Psycon. Oh yes. And she was one of the speakers. And, yes, she uh, was. That was amazing. I, I adored meeting her in person. I'd, I'd spoken to her over the internet before, but I'd never met her in person. And and the idea is, is that people will, okay, here's here's the typical person who sees, oh, I think I'll att attend one of these conferences. I've been reading the magazine for a hundred years and it's time for me to go. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll, they think of it as an academic conference and they, they believe that there's start times, end times, and then you go do whatever else you're going to do in Vegas. And a lot of times they'll bring a, a, a person with them, you know, they're a, a spouse who isn't really into the skeptic stuff. And then they want to go see shows and they want to go to dinner or whatever, you know, and, and do something completely different. But what the experience is, is when you get there, you're sitting in an audience with people you don't know, but you, you start talking to the person next to you. Maybe you're in one of those round tables for a while or you're just in the audience and you start talking to them and you're, you're talking to them about what the lecture is going on. And then you get up to leave and you kind of walk off together and you're still walking together talking about, it, and you realize you have a lot in common and, Oh my gosh, you went to that university. I did too. Or I know somebody, you know, I'm in the same business as you are. And then you go, you're like, well, I was just going to go get something to eat. Or you go to one of the meals you've pre played and you sit with that person again and you're just talking to them. And, and the next thing you know, you your friends you know because you bonded yeah. over this and when you find out especially if you find somebody like me who is kind of a social butterfly of sorts everybody's welcome at my table and i always say if i have to i will start another table so that you could be there too but i love meeting all these people i love that they meet each other and get to know each other and then you just go to lunch together, you meet for breakfast, you eat for dinner, and then you find out everybody's going to the bar later or to hang out in some location. And you sit there and you talk till you play cards against humanity or whatever you do and you drink. It's not, some people drink a lot. Some people don't drink at all. So I'm not a drinker. So don't get turned off by that. But you'll, you'll, you'll sit and you socialize and then you go hang out with somebody else over here who invited you to go to dinner over here. It's a lot of eating going on at these conferences. You guys. A, it's a unique experience. And you don't Absolutely. really have time to go to shows or go hang out with your spouse somewhere. Unless yeah, we generally do the thing you. arrive the day before. Really, arrive the day before, off, to, to, go to, to, see, to see a, To see a show, yeah. Yeah, or stay yeah. way late. My first year, we did that to see Penn and Teller a uh, Wednesday night, I think. But you arranged for other people in the group. Yeah, we did that. I, I made go. an online Facebook group, and I got Paula and uh, five other people. Mike came, um, Stu, jo Stu Jones and his wife, yeah. So that, yeah, that was fun. we went to the Pinball Machine um, Museum this last year. We got there early, met Brandy, and we ha played pinball. Yes, Brandy. The other GSOW editor I interviewed for the Skeptic Zone because yeah. it, she was, it was her first time, and that was fascinating. And she, the unique thing about her, she brought her son Aiden, so I interviewed both of them. And uh, he was a, a Brian Green fan who was the you know, a keynote speaker, so that was really cool. So it's it's... So you don't have to join the GSOW project to hang out, you know, or hang out with us. It's, I, I hate clicks. I absolutely detest that idea of a click. I always been anti click. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's just, that's how it is with these conferences. They're just a great time to socialize and a great time to, to be there. Join the Facebook group before you go. So you can start to get to know people. And then over time you will, you will find people to socialize with or just, let me know. Hey, give me a heads up. You know, One of the inter interesting conversations I had, so I don't want to turn people here off here who are believers, who have a religious faith, um, but a fairly large number of skeptics don't, and you know, not everyone. But uh, you know, in my normal life, you don't talk about that because you're, if you're an atheist like I am, you're a minority. Whereas this conference was the first time I ever went where uh, it was the opposite. I think if there was a believer in the crowd, they would keep quiet because, you know, they would feel like they're going to be, I don't think they would be attacked, but they might feel like 
the tables were turned, you know, and I'm not going to say I believe because then you're going to be challenged. Whereas here, it was a common conversation. Oh, when did you deconvert? What was your religion? Like, you know, when did you realize it was all BS? And that was interesting. I had never experienced that before. I'm not from a very religious part of the United States, but still it's enough where everyone goes to a church or a synagogue or something. And it's like, you know, I'm the outsider who doesn't do that, even in my extended family. So this was a weird feeling. And then George Robb, I don't remember if it was the first year or the second year, but he, he plays the song that's, uh, you know, the least you can do is the name of it. It's fantastic. If, if you like that sort of thing, look it up on YouTube. Uh, it's actually, you know, the, the refrain is thoughts and prayers is the least you can do. And it's, it's all about how ridiculous it is thinking you're going to pray and get help. Um, yeah. And, and so, wow, he premiered that on the stage at this conference. I mean, it's not an atheist conference, but, you know, that's like, well, okay. So that gives you a, you know, a feel for what is okay to talk about here. Mm -hmm. That that was interesting. Okay, so now Rob, I I wanted to talk to you about the the volunteer group you're doing, but we we probably should uh, end this fairly soon. How can you give us fifteen minutes on uh, your um? Oh, oh I mean, I, I don't, I don't have. I don't know how long you want to talk. I don't have a time limit, but it won't take that long. No, well, no, it's just, it's an interesting thing. Like, so I, I, I was- Tell what you're doing with your time besides GSO so, and all the other things. Yeah, so I, I realized I was a non-believer and called myself an atheist when I was in my 20s, I guess, at that point. And sometime I, you know, went through the stage where I'm not an atheist, I'm an agnostic, but then I realized no, I'm an atheist. Uh, I never really did anything with, with um, you know, the activism in that vein. Uh, until just a few months ago, and I was listening to, I think it was the Atheist Experience podcast, and um, the founder of Recovering from Religion, Dr. Daryl Ray, was on it, talking about it. I had peripherally heard about it, but not a lot, and he explained what it was, and they need helpline volunteers, and what you do is you take calls from people, or are, I'll read the, uh, their goals are to provide hope, healing, and support for people struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. So that's what we do. You call us or you chat to us and we help with those things. And it's, it's kind of fascinating. It's, you know, the point is not to deconvert somebody. Frankly, most of the people have just deconverted themselves, but they're struggling with, oh my God, what if I'm wrong? What if hell is, is a real thing? Mm -hmm. and, and they have all these questions like, how do I know, like where the universe come from if God didn't make it? Um, you know, things like that. There are some people who, who haven't lost their faith. They're just pissed off about how women are treated in their specific religion. And they want to talk about that or people who don't like their minister and just want to change to another church. So we will help them too. We'll help it. We meet people where they are essentially, but you know, predominantly it is helping people who have, are starting the journey out of, out of a religious belief system. <laughs> Uh, get your cat, your cat like running goats. across your tail. Ghosts, your they just go where they go. You can't do anything about it. At least ghosts don't make you sneeze with cat hair on your nose. But so they shoot at, I, I hear they shoot ectoplasm. Don't today they shoot is ecto her day. Ectoplasm. Prove me wrong, Kenny. Don't go shoot ectoplasm of people's noses or out of people's noses. I, yeah, they came out of people's throats. That's what it was. Anyway, so that's my other thing. And I started doing that just a couple of months ago. And it's been very rewarding. I mean, I had calls from people of all different kinds of religions and uh, it's, it's, it's painful sometimes hearing the stories uh, you know some are easier than some calls are easier than others but I, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing I feel like I'm you know being able to help people so that's really cool so well, tell us a little more about some of the, the calls that you can you can reveal without giving out too much information so that they oh well so it, it, I, if I, if I, had, I just put them in categories so I had to categorize it it's mostly people of the first category I said, uh, you know, um, I am, you know, no longer a believer. Sometimes it's just a few days, sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's months, but they haven't, they've been mulling it over, like what to do, who to sell. And normally they're in an environment they can't tell anybody, right? All their family, all their friends are religious. They might, young person, still go to a religious school, can't talk about it with anyone. Or maybe they broached the subject and they were immediately shut down. Like you can't have a doubt like that, you know? Mm -hmm you're going to go to hell. So they found our number and they call us and we talk about it. And like, you know, it's issues of how to deal with, with people like that. And we point them to resources. We have a very good recovery from religion.org. And now I'm going to give their, their speech has a very good resource team, which puts together resources to help people, depending on what your issues are. And we can point them at those. Um, we also have uh, groups. We also have something for people who actually need therapy because we don't give therapy in this line. This is a more of a peer support. Um, this is, you know, uh, therapists, psychologists, 
uh, register with us uh, and they promise not to use religion uh, of any sort in their practice. Um, you know, a lot of people get into therapy. They really love their therapist. They might be seeing them for many months. And then the shit hits the fan when the therapist says, okay, we'll fix this. Come, let's pray to Jesus. And if you're an atheist, that just blew your trust in the person. So the Secular Therapy Project is a way to set up therapists who do not do that with clients who don't want that done. So we, we tell them about that and we can hook them up with those people. And the last thing we do is we have an online community, kind of like our private Facebook cabal, except mm -hmm. it's not on Facebook. It's this other thing called Slack, which is a team uh, work uh, tool, which I had never heard of before. And it has all separate groups. So there's ex-Mormons, ex-Jehovah Witnesses, ex-Pentecostal Christians, ex-Muslims or just general religious discussion. And people can ask to be in this and then they chat with others who go through the same issues. So, you know, that's, that's the bottom line. So there's, there's also um, an effort because we're, we're having more and more volunteers, which is a good thing. Now they're kind of growing beyond the original software and they're trying to do something which is called uh, RFR 3.0. I guess we're on 2.0 and they're updating all the software and user interfaces and whatever and since i have experience with that i'm on that team also to help out with the behind the scenes or to fix that. <laughs> yeah it's I, I could not have done this this was actually coincident with me retiring I, I had some more time and i decided i had always wanted to do this sort of thing never really you know think i would it would be i always thought it would, i'll put it this way i thought it would be an interesting thing to do and all of a sudden i had time and then i heard the interview with dal ray and it just clicked and it's like okay i should call and volunteer mm -hmm. the really cool thing was it was a famous person who interviewed me for the job oh, yeah. um you probably don't know him but it's anthony magda bosco i know okay so yeah I so pe so for people who don't he's he's a big into a, a, a way of understanding how we understand things called street epistemology. And it's a way of questioning people with what's called a Socratic method, basically asking questions rather than challenging people directly. And he does this in college campuses mostly, and he has these online interviews. You could look it up with street epistemology. I've seen, I've seen and, and, and so he's, I didn't know, he was part, he's part of RFR. I don't know if he's on the board or what, but he's definitely a volunteer there. And, you know, I'm told that somebody will call you for an interview and immediately I recognize his voice because I've seen tons of his interviews. And I, is your last name Magna Bosco? <laughs> and he goes, damn, I have to start, stop doing this or something because everyone recognizes me now. Yeah, he's, he's got a YouTube channel that I, I, I remember I wasn't feeling well one day and I just been watched him talking to people. Some of them yeah, it's really fascinating to watch, but it's, it's it's interesting to see how people overwhelmingly it seems like what what he finds is that people haven't really thought about their religion in comparison to other religions before they've they've thought mine is a religion but when you say well that guy over there he's a Mormon yeah. and he thinks right. he has a real true religion right so who's right because right? right. there's a conflict there and, and they're like right. well no mine is and they're like well that guy would say his is well, that's, that was my journey out of religion. My, I, I was raised as a, I told this whole story on, uh, on uh, Phil Ferguson's podcast because he's into skepticism and atheism. And he, and he asked me the question. I'll give the short version. Basically, my family was Catholic, giant Italian family. And within one summer, they all converted to evangelical, Pentecostal, speaking in tongues. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, except for my immediate family. All right, so not my father, mother, or two siblings, but all of my uncles and aunts and 21st cousins within a one horrible summer converted to this religion. And it's like, you know, we didn't drink the Kool-Aid, the whole rest of them did. And the, the, the question was, um, in my mind, well, form of Christianity, how do I know mine is right if I think they're wrong? So and that's what did it. It was a very short few months after that that I realized, yeah, mine isn't any more real than they're rolling on the floor speaking in tongues. Very good, very good. Um, if anybody has any questions for Rob, um, please give them to us quickly because we are, we're, we're, we're at two hours almost and uh, my stomach says it's time and my cat is telling me that she, the problem with petting her, which I love doing, is that it makes so much fur and <laughs> and she it makes her more aggressively wanting to be pet. <laughs> yes, that's, that is their way. Find me with a little claws. Just that is some their more. way. Why aren't you putting me some more? I'm, this is, I'm really shocked she's here this long as she has. Usually she's wandered off to go sleep somewhere, but for some reason. Oh, I just realized something we didn't talk about the promos. Oh yeah, that yeah. was. But Rob's that was really cool. good at just 
saying this needs to be done and do it. And and this is what Paula does, Paulinda does for me a lot too, is she sees, she says, this really needs to be done. But Paulina hasn't quite got to the point where she just does it without me having to say. That's oh, I don't. I, I always just, ask. Just you. do it, and I I'm sure I'll be fine with it. it won't so the fun. short, so the short story, quick story here is story. that GSOW had a promo out with was just one person give, speaking a, a script about the, you know, oh, this is crazy pseudoscience, and if you want to fight it, join us, and that was basically it. So I, I heard it, and that was one of the things that I originally heard that got me interested in joining GSOW. And in fact, what I did is like, hey, you know, I've only heard one of these. What if I, you know, I wrote down what the words were and I did it and I did it in an Italian accent for Susan. <laughs> and she didn't like that. <laughs> so I was you with a really strong Brooklyn accent. Didn't well, you? yeah, it's an Italian Brooklyn accent. Yeah, so then so then you said, no, do it seriously. So really, you want me to do that? So then I did it seriously. And, I, you know, before I knew it, she put music on it and released it. It's like, oh, wow, that was a shock. Because I was just joking <laughs> around. But then I thought, well, okay, so now this is stale. We've had this two or three versions of this out. You know, let's make it a little more interesting. So I, I wrote a script which had, it was kind of the gist of what Susan had originally written, but I expanded on it so that I had separate people giving their opinions of wacky stuff in the beginning. And it was each separate voice, a separate person would read it. And then it was a GSOW person in fact i made it two people alternating telling the, the listeners about gsow how you can combat that nonsense that you just heard mm -hmm. so uh, i wrote that script and uh, the, the first version had i think it was five gsow editors lend their voice to saying things like you know homeopathy is real my psychic is real things like that and then i got uh paul serrano to help me and we alternated talking about how you can fight this on the internet by joining our team and working on Wikipedia as a part of GSOW. And then I went one step further and I thought, well, now I've met all these other people at the conferences and I have some in with them. And it's like, I wonder if they would help out. So I got, I'll read the list here. I got all these people to pretend they were true believers by, by saying what they really didn't believe the most and doing different versions of that same thing. I released three other versions with the famous podcaster voices in the beginning and then Paula and I giving the same GSOW information at the end. But the people who helped out with that were Ben Radford and Celestia Ward from Squaring the Strange, Jelena Levin from the ESP, uh, Richard Saunders, thank you, from the Skeptic Zone. He played it a lot also. Evan Bernstein and Bob Novella from the SGU. Uh, Ross Blotcher from Ono, oh Ross and Carrie. And then Kevin Sinopathy, who was doing the POI uh, for uh, CFI for a while, point of inquiry. And then lastly, I actually went into the atheist realm and I got the friendly atheist crew, Hemant Mehta and Jessica Plunky, to, to do it also. So it, it, they were really fun to do. I did we, it we, once. What's that? I was, I was on there. And, and Susan. I'm sorry. Well, I guess that kind of counts as a GS, I didn't. Oh, yeah. So, but no, you did it as part of those. That was cool. So, and, and, and as I recall, you talked about... On TV, Sweden Combustion. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. It was something like, you know, I believe yeah. that I'm going to burst into flames at any minute. Like, uh, yeah, I read it on the internet. It has to be true. Right. Yeah. I mean, why would they want to torture poor little kids? Right. I was a little, just a little girl. Right. I didn't know. Celestia Ward had just given birth, so she talked about all the mommy woo. You know, eating the placenta is the best thing to do because, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow said so. <laughs> it's like something like that. It was really, I, Richard's, uh, Ben Radford was, you know, precious because he's written a book literally on the chupacabra, right? Uh, uh, and, and he said something, oh, I, I know, you know, Bigfoot's a, Bigfoot is a hoax, but the chupacabra, that's real. That was made by genetic experiments <laughs> in a lab. Right there, Rob, I'm impressed. What's that? Your voice was really good right there. <laughs> well, I don't ask me to do Richard Saunders because I can't do Australian. But he talked about crop circles and also psychic detectives. He did it twice. Very good. Evan talked about his bugaboo is um, is is possession and demons. So he talked about that. Bob Novella, I could have guessed what he was going to talk about. It was basically uh, quantum woo, and you know, using stating that quantum consciousness is real. He was basically slamming Deepak Chopra without using his name. <laughs> So that was great. And and both Hemet and Jessica from the Friendly Atheist talked about creationism kind of issues, right? Uh, Hemet was, um, you know, something like, oh, yeah, I know the Earth is only 4,000 years old. And then Jessica's was, oh, if we evolve from monkeys, how come there's still monkeys? It was like, <laughs> they were precious. It's great. And I don't really have anything to do with them. Rob does them on his own. And I, I'm like, 
who are these people? I recognize the voice, but I can't quite place it. And they're all podcasts pretty much that I've, I've listened to. So it's really fascinating to go, oh, that's Ross Blotcher. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Ross is great. Yeah. Ross's was about flat earth. Flat earth. He, he, he and Carrie had done a long series on flat earth stuff. So, he, you know, of course the earth is flat. Now it's just lying to us. <laughs> Great. So you can find these promos. Uh, Rob, uh, maybe Rob will put them in a place on Facebook on this chat somewhere after we hang up so that we can we can actually you guys can check out these uh, promos because they're really they're like a minute long, two minutes long. Yeah, a minute, minute and half. And yeah. BSP and uh, Richard Saunders is on the Skeptic Zone have been playing them for us, which has been really great. And we get we get people from time to time that want to join the GSW project from hearing it. Some some people, this has really been fascinating to me. Some people hear about the GSOW project the first time and they're like sending me an email before I've finished the podcast or interview they're listening to. They want to join so bad. They're like, I've been looking for a project for so long, something I could do over the internet, something that makes a real difference. Something take my time doing. And then other people, they'll write to me. I've been listening to you on skepticality and the skeptic zone and at conferences for four years. Finally, you have worn me down. I am going to join this project. Oh, that's it's cool. Dyna dynamic, you know, that some people just, they're just not ready to do it yet. And some people are like, I, I am on this. This is my thing. I'm doing this now. I mean, you just need that's an cool. internet connection. You do have to be on Facebook because we have the secret cabal. You don't have to be active on Facebook. You just have to have. Yeah. I mean, if you don't like Facebook generally for personal things, you just make an account and only use it for this. Uh, you know, yeah. So, you so, know about it, so that's good. It, but we've tried other things on Facebook and it does not work. Sorry, you guys quit suggesting it to me because I'm not going to use Slack. Yeah. <laughs> Or any of those other things, it's just not going to happen. I've got cat hair all over my keyboard now. I'm telling you, she Deborah says I have to comb her at least once a week, but time means nothing anymore. <laughs> yeah, that is that you is used oddly to, true. Used to comb them, and you know, you forget about that. And so, Rob, are you reading anything interesting these days, or anything that um, I know I have? books upon books upon books upon books i've got to read magazines i'm behind on my skeptical inquire magazines I'm i i am no it's unfortunate it's, it's weird i'm getting so far behind in everything like that because what i have retired from work i used to have a nearly hour at least 45 minute commute on a good day each direction and i would do audiobooks and i don't do that anymore because I, now i'm staying home not going anywhere uh, so that was my like audiobook and podcast reading time, and unfortunately, I'm falling behind on all of that. And I, 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 I had to quit several yeah, podcasts. Bad. I felt really awful about it, but to catch up is just, I you know, and I'm I've been retired for three years now, something like that. And wow, it, that long. Okay, yeah, it feels like I was 54. But the thing is, is that just because you're retired, you just don't necessarily have the time because I, I'm hardly. I, I don't know where it's going. I mean, I'm doing these kinds of things, which I really enjoy. And I've been starting doing trivia. If anybody's interested in trivia, it's Thursday nights. Trivia, Thursday night, fantastic. Uh, Pacific, uh, California time. And so I have to write all the questions and all that. And I've got a garden and, you know, there's things to do. But the point is, is that I have got so much to read. I started reading this book by Carl Zimmer. Um, it's the, she has her mother's laugh. I started reading that two years ago, and every time I pick it up, I say, this is so good. I absolutely am adoring this, and I just can't sit, seem to get myself to sit down and finish it, even though I enjoy it. I read Paul Offit's book, Bad Advice, and exceptional, really good. And I did just order, I know I this is really bad. I, I shouldn't even admit it on TV, I mean, on the radio. I just ordered Mary Trump's book. I was listening to a couple of interviews. I'm like, all right, all right. I'm worn down. I will buy the book. I normally wouldn't buy a book like that, but I did. And I, I don't know why I'm not sitting down to read like a regular hardcover book because it's like I'm either doing I'm either I'm either doing something on Wikipedia, or I'm doing an article skeptical on fire, or now I'm doing the recovering from religion volunteer work. So it's just like I, I haven't been reading at all, unfortunately. By the way, so I just posted the link to our promos in the About Time Project in, in the live, okay, the live stream. The About Time Project page, Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, and it's actually it's like actually it. uh it's it's their YouTube video. I converted the podcast audio to YouTube videos with a with a slide, and that was actually so that it could be used on um, the Skeptics in the Pub UK uh, promotional thing. They do a, they do um, 
think it's they're doing weekly presentations. And uh, before the speaker comes on, they actually have something running like you would do in an old fashioned movie theater where you'd have slides going on advertising certain things. Well, they'll advertise skeptic groups and, and their upcoming events. And so uh, they, they agreed to, to, sh to have one of our promos there. So I put a slide with a QR code so people can snap it with the camera and go to YouTube and watch these. So that's why I created them anyway. Listen to them, listen to them. There's no video. No, it's video, it's on YouTube. I mean, yeah. Well, not the promos don't have any video. Yes, they do. The YouTube version does. It's a YouTube. It's YouTube. I mean, it's not a moving, you know, it, it, there's a slide it's there, which, yeah, yeah. which actually can... changes, but it, it, there is something in the video. It's not a blank screen. Wait, 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 wait. I missed the fact that I, that we were doing video of us. That would be kind of interesting. Yeah. No, it, it, it's just, it's basically the Gorilla Skeptic promo with some interesting supplementary, you know, text added to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's worth it's worth to check it out. Well, I guess we should end. I don't see any massive questions because I think we've answered them. In Two our... hours. Wow, we didn't go three because, like your your so, psychic thing, but that's good. Well, the good psychic enough. thing ended a little after two hours, and I just I I had to get done, and it was taking a long time. If you guys haven't seen it, I did an interview. Uh, psychic gave me a free reading yesterday on, Facebook. and it was spot on, right? She's like headed for the to get the quarter million dollar I challenge. Shocked. I was shocked. She was, she was so right on. So right on. She. We're, we've been so wrong all this time. We'll have to go and re-edit all the Wikipedia yeah, pages where we trash skept psychics. Because uh, psychic powers are real, but according to yeah, the yeah. person. I did it live. So she's on the speaker phone because she didn't do Zoom or anything like that. But I said, I'm going to do this live. She didn't really know it was live, but I told her I wanted to do it live. She said, I'm fine with you recording it. So I just made it live because I kind of thought, you know, to be fair to her, what if she is absolutely accurate? Yeah. She could I could have been the first this out therapy to everybody so that in case she's rock solid on it. And then it I was weird that you put yourself out there for this test, though, because you are one of the most Googleable people uh, to husband. find out. And, and I think she you even sent her articles. So she had articles you wrote. Okay. So is oh, she, she did. Had, she read one of my articles, which she is read. Like, it. OK, that's what I was remembering. So, I was totally right. expecting to be hot red, but she. Yeah. Once you do that, anyone can find anything about you, but she didn't even do that. So she must really believe she's got this power because she didn't even try to do that. Yeah. And she, uh, it was, it was embarrassingly bad with, she tried so hard, but it, to me and to everybody who watched and there was, it's, it's been viewed hundreds of times already. Um, even it's been three hours, I guess. And as you told me just before we started, she thought she did a good job, right? I think she, I don't know. She never asked me how I did. I, how, how it went, but I think it was pretty obvious that it couldn't have been that great because I didn't give her a lot of feedback and I didn't say, well, that was great. Thank you so much. When can I get another reading? But, um, I really believe this is somebody who's been cold reading and doesn't realize she's cold. Yeah. Reading. Yeah. She's been doing it since she was a young girl and this is her, her talent, her skill. And, and for her not to be able to do this anymore, so what does what does Mark think about this? Because I, I I think my impression is that Mark doesn't believe anyone doesn't know they're doing it. Um, no, I think he thinks there are no, no, no. I know for a fact that he believes that some people do it, not knowing they're cold reading. Because we met a woman, okay, uh, Maria Meinbrek, on a one of the James Randi cruises. And she had been doing cold reading and crystal reading, crystal healing and stuff. And she, one of the first things she found was one of Mark's lectures or one of Mark's things. And he explained in his lecture about cold reading. And she realized, oh my gosh, that's what I've been doing all this time. And so I don't think, I think this is person's in the same field. Janice Boynton watched the three hours and she says it was fascinating to watch, sad, but fascinating. And I think that I put a lot in her brain after she left. She had done nothing in her research all these years to uh, in the skeptic field. She thought us our skeptic group movement was not what she thought. We, what you know that she didn't expect that to find what she thought. She she had watched a few videos, totally misinterpreting them. She'd seen the the James Randi had done a TED talk where he took homeopathic pills one after another to commit suicide, supposedly. She thought he really was trying to commit suicide and she thought, why didn't anybody call 911? 
when I was trying to explain it was just sugar pills and they're homeopathy, so they're sugar pills. I don't think she quite understood it. She, um, I explained a lot to her, but I really think, I just let her go for the reading part. She talked to my grandparents who, um, two of them, I just had to say their name and they showed up, which is amazing considering I've been spending hours and hours and hours doing genealogy. I guess I don't need to do that anymore if I just call up my grandparents. Wait, wait, say that again. She said their name? I said their names you and they said. called them forward. So I said, I want to see Oh, that's how it works. Grandfather. And he comes forward and he has a big black dog. He, so, so how come all the other ones always do, I, I hear a name with a J or an M? This one or, does it differently. Oh. It's just different. This one's a genuine psychic. Okay. And she's a skeptic too, she says. So, <laughs> I love what people do that. Yeah. And oh, so, everyone does that. I'm a flat earther, but I'm a skeptic. So. I'm a skeptic too. I really believe in science, but the earth is flat. But <laughs> she, she believed that. Uh, oh, and so, so I was able to interact. She was telling me what my grandparents were saying about me and how much they, I was their, my grandfather. I'm apparently her, my, his favorite. And we've shared a bowl of popcorn together. Um, my grandfather died in 1929. So I find that very hard to believe, but and Wait, she gave, she gave that date. Oh, no, I, I didn't say anything. I just said, I'd like to hear about my grandfather. Can That's you... what I'm saying. So she just pulled that date out of the air? No, no, I pulled the date out of the air. Oh, oh. No, wait. Okay, so let me be clear. I said, can you tell me something about my grandfather? Um, I, and she says, we'll say his name. I said, his name is Frank Gerbeck. And she goes, okay, let me, let me concentrate. Okay, I'm getting a man with very strong hands, very big build. Um, and then it was, there was a dog. It was a black Labrador. And does this make any sense to you? And I'm like, well, I'm not really sure. And she says... Well, you know, you were his favorite and that you guys shared a bowl of popcorn together and blah, blah, blah. And she's going on. And I'm saying in the chat, because we got Facebook going on the side, she can't see that. I'm like, my grandfather died in 1929. So I never met this man. I've never met a single one of my grandparents. They've all been dead. And, she's, and then she goes, I said, well, you know, how about my grandmother on my mom's side? Her name is Myrtle Finley. She goes, oh, yes, I'm seeing her. And she's this, this, this. Did you try just giving that. a fake name? Although no, that sounds like a fake name. I didn't need to because because that would there was no reason to she, Mary Smith and she said, Oh yes, I'm now talking to Mary Smith, who's your grandmother. Well, I could have done that. I was gonna have her read Imogen, actually, to be honest with you. Because <laughs> the woman could see who was on the she's screen. She's soft and and, and, and cuddly and, and she's got and she, does, she doesn't know about her family and you know what happened to her siblings and, and her parents. I mean, you know, I was going to do that, but I thought, no, I'm gonna play this straight. I'm I'm gonna be up front not try to trick her or anything and i was just careful the way i worded it like with my grandmother i said so i'd like to hear about my grandmother her name is myrtle thinley and she's like okay and what would you like to know i said well just any memory she wants to share with me or anything you know i'd love to hear anything she has to say i didn't say i'd never met her i didn't say that she died in 1925 um my mom barely remembered her so <laughs> My mom was born in 1922. So there's not really, so I, I was, oh, oh, that my grandmother who died in 1925, one of the things that was very, very clear is that she did not like the man who fathered my children. She was very careful not to say my husband. She, the psychic did know that I was not currently married um, because I came out earlier in the, in the reading, but she said, that I, um, that my grandmother was not happy with the man who had fathered my children, because she did also came out earlier that I have, I have children, and grandchildren are apparently on the way, my kids are learning about that right now, but wow. <laughs> by the end of the year, I should know. So did, did you challenge Sterling or Caspian, did you say? Caspian did come by today, and I did say, hey, I was just letting you know that apparently <laughs> you have some news for me by the end of the year, he's like, oh, ready then. <laughs> considering sterling is not uh, have a love interest at the moment and he's locked in with covid and meeting no one <laughs> that's going to be really interesting well, i hear there's going to be vaccine parties so you know oh yeah covid parties yeah no vaccine parties once there's a vaccine available you can get together with anyone randomly so there people you go they're going to go up and randomly rub their hands on people's face <laughs> put their hand this is what it feels lives. like to hug somebody and shake hands oh my gosh i want to i'm going to wipe my tears all over you i want to touch your fluids oh that sounded really, <laughs> really, really anyway so the psychic has cleared up so much for me. And I told Imogen, I said uh, earlier today, I said, I'm really sorry that I didn't 
get your reading done yesterday. So but I, I met two people <laughs> at Kenny Biddle's house. Uh, if people who don't know, I don't know if he's still online anyway. Kenny Biddle, paranormal investigator, ex-ghost hunter, really believer, tried to photograph ghosts. Ghost came killer, he said earlier. What's that? Ghost killer, he called himself. Ghost before. killer. Now he's a ghost killer, right. So now, now he's on the other side of the fence, the you know rational side, and he realized basically not only was he doing it wrong, but everyone who's still doing it is doing it wrong. And he writes articles about the subject, fabulous investigations. Really but so he was talking at PsyCon this last year and he invited people over his house for a dry run of his presentation. And I took him up on the offer and I was the only skeptic who came. I think others were invited, but there were other people he, he keeps in touch with from the paranormal community there. It's the first time I had ever met anybody in person who was like this. There were people from ghost hunting teams and two of the women believed that they were psychic mediums. So it's like, yeah, it was interesting. We got to talk after Kenny's presentation. One of them hung out. We talked for like, I think it was another hour. And she was asking, why don't you believe me, to me and Kenny? And like, you know, okay, why do you believe it? We were having a pleasant conversation about it. But it's, you know, it's clear. She doesn't charge people. She just does it because she's got the power and she wants to help her friends. And she probably really just believes it, you know. Very probably likely. is good at cold reading. Um, yeah. That's what I told the psychic last, right as I was ending, I was trying to let her down. But I explained to her, I said, you seem very kind and compassionate. I think you probably believe that you're helping lots of people uh -huh. and that you are probably intuitively um, you know, really paying good attention to what people are saying. You're a good listener and, um, you know, a caring person. But have you ever tested yourself to see if you actually have this ability? Because, you know, how do you tell the difference between somebody's cold reading right. and somebody who really believes that they're, you know, somebody's cold reading and somebody really is just psychic, which we've never had before. But my point is, is, and she's like, well, I've never tested myself. I don't even know how I would test myself. Or, or she does say she tests herself. Here's, here's how she gave a test. This is great. She says, sometimes I have problems. You know, I, I've, I've had moments where I felt like I wasn't really doing this. I said, yeah, well, how do you know that it's not just happening in your brain and you're making it up? And she said, well, one time she was at the mall. Get this. This is proof. She was at the mall. And she was walking out of the mall to go to her car. And she says, I'm going to see a red car pass by. Oh, wow. What are the odds? <laughs> I know, in a mall parking lot. And she's walking. Red. Out. That's such a weird and color. Not a red car. And she got to her car and then a red car went by. Mm. So she has, the, she has the power. And if she was I on said, the road for a half hour and a red car went by, she still would have. And I explained to her car. how, you know, as humans, we try to find correlations between these and patterns and if she had not seen a red car at all she probably would have forgotten all about it and she True. remembered well you know sometimes it doesn't work it's not always perfect. Yeah, right. remember the right. hits right, right. and i said and that doesn't really i mean you know what's the odds of that being in a parking lot of a red car you know i'm thinking yeah. and so yeah i so that's proof to you that you just, said you're going to see a red car in a parking lot and you saw a red car in a parking lot and that's so I, as we've all discussed you know lack of critical thinking education is you know you learn facts in school but you don't learn you know you don't learn logical fallacies you don't learn the, the premises of, of logic and reason and that's a problem and then that's you know people will never consider this they just don't law of large numbers uh you know the chances of something happening by random chance we think that she's never been challenged before because whenever she got too. Yeah. people were saying I bet you she's always had feedback. She's done most of her readings in person. And to be on phone with somebody that she had not read before, because I think she's yeah. done phone readings now, but I think they're all people she knows and who, yeah, are, yeah. who are filling in the blanks. Like if she says something, they would say yes or no about it and give the answer. Right. So I now, think the first time she's ever come up against somebody who didn't give her feedback and she couldn't see and who, who it was some of the evidence she, she was giving about stuff. And I said, well, you know, we really wouldn't consider that evidence. And she says, what? I guess some friend of hers yeah. had, oh, had burned her hand. And she said, I'm feeling something really hot. And her friend said, yeah, I just burned my hand. And so she took that as being evidence that she's definitely psychic. And I'm like, and, you know, that's not evidence. That's not, that's not, so what? People burn their hands when they cook. What, you know, it wasn't like a big deal. She's like, kind of like i can't believe you didn't think that was evidence of a the, the anecdotal fallacy yeah it was 
yeah, yeah well, one of the things I want I want to do a presentation on probably for a local skeptics or a humanist group is logical fallacies. I kind of fell in love with them once I heard about them not too not too long ago myself, maybe five years ago, and they talk about it occasionally on the skeptic zone and things like that. Also uh, the SGU. Um, so yeah, I've been doing a series that's now 32 weeks. I haven't missed a week, amazingly, of sort of releasing one a week, a logical fallacy of the week. I when I was still working, I was putting one up in my cafeteria and, you know, it was causing conversations amongst people I know. Who's doing that? Who, said, who says homeopath homeopathy isn't real? Because <laughs> besides defining the fallacy, I would have an example of the real world from the either skeptic or scientific uh, arena. So, you know, that would be like, so um, let's say the argument from authority, you know, describe what that was, you know, uh, giving somebody credence uh, in a field he's not an expert in, or, or against, even if he is in a field, going against a scientific consensus in that field just because he's an expert, right? And then the example was, you know, Dr. Oz promotes psychics on his show all the time. Therefore, psychic mediums must be real. And, you know, I, of course, psychic mediums are real. Why did you put that as an example? You know that. Or the anecdotal evidence fallacy. You know, uh, my, you know, my mother and all of my friends tell me how myopathy works, so I know it has to. And I'll, I'll put on the bottom, you know, that example. Uh, and why did somebody put this up? Homeopathy is real. You know, <laughs> it, would, it would engender conversation. But now I have a set of 32, and I'm going to try to make it at least to the end of the year. There's enough to go around, I think. <laughs> well, I and, and put them into, you know, a presentation. And uh, Mark Edward, uh, who just popped his head in before, suggested uh, I make sure I go to 52 so I can put them on playing cards, on the back of playing cards. <laughs> mm. Well, I have to the front of playing cards, because otherwise we could tell the back of the playing cards were... Well, the, the, you know, not the, you know, not the side with the numbers, the, number, the, the, the pips on them, not the side with the pips on the back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you your cat has been very interesting. He has uh, been exploring your outlet on the other side of the... Again, I'm missing all of this. Yeah, okay. so Misty went walking over there and smelled... No, she stared at the outlet. No, not this cat, the other one. She came over to the outlet over on the side. Uh, that, that one? Yeah. Okay, that, that's, an air, that's an air vent. She, she, it's oh. her habit. None of the other six cats I've had or so uh, ever do this, but she does it. She goes from all around the house. She stands in front of those vents occasionally, just oh, she air likes air the breeze. Oh, she God. Likes I've never seen anything like that in California. <laughs> we don't have that here. That's because you have lemon trees all over the place. Yeah, we do. We have lemon trees everywhere. But she went over and she, she, she sat there and went like this to the out, whatever that air vent is for a while and just... I thought, is she talking to the wall? Is Lemon she... trees is a non sequitur for this conversation, but it was from the trivia night people because uh, uh, Susan had a trivia. Susan runs it. She has a trivia question. There are many teams, very interesting people uh, join up uh, and uh, we go into teams and we, we, we answer the trivia questions and see who can win as a team. And one of the and one of the questions was very California centric. And Calif Cal apparently California people are in a bubble, and they think everyone's got lemon trees all over the place. Because the question was, this is some something that everyone has and too much of, and they give to their neighbors. <laughs> I live in New Jersey. What are you talking about? <laughs> I know somebody in the neighborhood who has a lemon tree that's. <laughs> no. <laughs> you meet a new neighbor, and they say, "Hey, by the no. way, I've got a lemon tree. If you need lemons, let me know." Maybe zucchini or or tomatoes here. Well, zucchini and tomatoes are also a big thing here. Okay. In okay. Lemons definitely is also another one, and limes, and actually in my city, no, no citrus fruit here. and strawberries and bro broccoli and Brussels sprouts and ancho anchovies, uh, artichokes. Actually, we do have a lot of anchovies. I'm in Monterey Bay <laughs> area, so. Anchovies, I guess, could be. Oh, so I heard the part of, of the, saying something about your family lives near water. <laughs> You're going, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. She, she wanted to know which of my, she did get, she did say I had three siblings unit. I, I had to get that clarified. She said, I seen your siblings. How many do you have? And I'm like, well, are you counting step and, and half? And I don't have any step, grand, uh, step siblings. And I have one half sibling who's died. I don't know why she doesn't contact me, but you know, rude. But, um, <laughs> She lived in Ohio, but she, um, she says, I'm seeing three, a group of three. And I said, three siblings. And she's all, yeah. And I said, are they, does that include me? I mean, cause it was a really wide op open, a group of yeah, three. Yeah, that's good. See, that, see, see, that's hard to believe she doesn't do that on purpose because that's the kind of thing I I've seen people do with numbers. I I throw out three, knowing it could include you or not include a family of three that include the divorced parent or not the divorced parent yeah, or the yeah, kid or, or like, you know, right. Three. So, 
that's interesting. And you challenged her on it and you she know, had to clarify, but she got it right. She says, I'm seeing right. you and two siblings. A hit, a hit. Well, sort of. I kind of led her to it, I guess. But the point was is that I think she's a cold reader who okay. And I don't know this. And I, I looked at my email today before we did this call and she still hasn't written back to me. I'm not, I'm not reaching out to her. I don't see any reason to reach out to her. I told her to think about it. And if she wants to get in touch with me, um, we can talk about it. But she said, I think she really believes she has this power, but I think, and Janice Boynton and I were talking about this, how similar to this is to facilitated communication. She was like, wow, I've never seen a psychic reading before. And she says that just was setting off all these red flags that made me think of facilitated communication the way they... Because um, for, for people who haven't seen Janice, she was a facilitated communicator. And now right. she and I'll be talking to her on Wednesday. Knows it's, it's, not, it's, a, it's a pseudoscience. And it'll she be like the first time it. we've talked, we've got a lot planned. We're going to be talking about what the harm is in, in facilitated communication. We get some doozy stories for you. So, so Janice saw a connection between the psychic reading and people she doing... She definitely saw it. She hadn't seen it before. And how it looks like the psychic is having this internal discussion with themselves and thinking about what may be is there's that susan would be happening and so that they're creating this storyline that might seem real to them but actually and they're and they're projecting it onto me as if that is my storyline and in somewhere in her mind she's thinking and and i guess janice well she'll she'll explain on wednesday but i guess what janice is saying is that's what she thinks is going on with facilitators who who um are starting to get to the point where well she's you know the person they're facilitating isn't quite communicating really well maybe they mean cats you know you know they're they're having trouble spelling a word i guess and so now and if it's a cat then maybe maybe it's a cat that da -da, and then maybe it's this and it, and the story kind of goes to where maybe they're not maybe they kind of realize in their mind that they're not really um communicating your facilitated communication for that moment but it's just to help along mm. help along and i think that what was, was happening with this cold reader yesterday is that she believes that she's psychic but maybe that. she needs to pick a path and that's what celestia ward was saying it was like one of those books where you open it up okay if it's this then go to page 25 if mm. it's that go to page 97 and then the story continues on this path it's like an out, okay, yes, then go to here. Okay, no, go to there. And I think that that's kind of how the psychic was, was saying things was like- Yeah, I could see that. Was wording it in such a way that it could fit if I had a, if I wasn't married to the man who had my children, the way she worded it, so that it would fit both areas, but not, I think she wasn't wording it. If she really thought my grandmother was saying that she didn't, that my grandmother didn't like the man who fathered my children, I was married for 19 years. So my grandma, if she's been watching over me all these years, knows that, you know? And so why did grandma not just say your husband or your ex husband? Right, right, right. So she, the psychic, yeah. I think, had to make she that left it vague. say, well, I need to make this broad enough. Yeah. So that's that's how I don't understand how they don't know they're doing that. I think they fudge for the the, the ends justifying the means. I think they fudge yeah. it a little bit to kind of help it out, but I think they overwhelmingly think they are psychic. But just for this moment, they're going to have to kind of. Oh, I have I have what might be an interesting story to end this on. It's almost okay. five thirty now. Um, <laughs> just before COVID <laughs> broke out, like, oh, I can give you an hour, and you're like, okay, well, an hour is going to go by in like five minutes so just before covid broke out we went to the, the last party the, like thing that we would have went to it was a it was a party and my wife knows the uh the band leader and it was a uh, on the woodstock anniversary was this so, the loud party the what loud party the what, woman what? sitting on the other side of your wife and she was a psychic and yours no, yes you're... yes i told you this okay i love it but go ahead go ahead yes I just wanted, Wait, I want everybody to know I'm paying attention when you do tell stories. That's stuff. good. I didn't even remember telling you. So, yeah. So we're at the guest of honor's table because my wife is friends with this person from, they, like my other friend who had lo I had lost track with and found on Facebook. Similarly, this was a childhood friend she found fairly recently. And they invited us to this. And we're sitting as a guest of honor. Now, of course, I don't want to insult anybody because, hey, we're guests there. And the woman sitting on the other side of my wife at this table of maybe 10 struck up a conversation with her. 
and I couldn't hear because we're near the band, but like they're talking like they're friends. It's like, wow, this is interesting and cool. And then somewhere about halfway through the party, the woman had to leave early and she said goodbye to me and she left. And then my wife goes, you're not going to believe this. Well, actually, before that, before she left, we had one dance before she left. And she goes, I can't believe this is happening. And you're going to hate me, but I can't tell you now. Like, What are you talking about? So, all right. So like a half hour later, the woman leaves and she finally tells me this woman gave her a business card saying she's a psychic medium. And she said, I'm not going to tell you sitting on the other side of me. <laughs> Somebody who, who actively fights against belief in you people. You know, so, so she played along with it. And they, the woman actually was trying to pursue a friendship. My wife is a therapist. She was seeing herself sort of in that mode. She actually did spiritual healing. Her card had all that kind of stuff on it. And she was trying to make out like meeting my wife for lunch or someplace. It wasn't a friend of hers. It was somebody she met at the party. Never met. And it was also because it was at the table. It was somebody. So my wife was afraid that I was going to, you know, if she told me, I was going to like be belligerent about it. You were going to go all storm like a, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I would have done that. I, I, might, I might have asked a few questions, but she was deadly afraid that I was going to go ballistic on her. I think, in fact, my like I was scheduled for that week or the next week to do my What's the Harm in Believing a Psychic's presentation. You know, and here's somebody sitting on the other side of her who she doesn't want me to know is a psychic. She says she's a psychic. Yeah. But so, and this woman was like... Um, an executive in a company for many, many decades. And then she got laid off and she felt she had this power and wanted to explore it and give back to the world. So she probably believes it too. I think there's more people who really do. I, I Mark, I think would say, um, he always says that it's like two and a half percent of the people who are psychics, working as psychics, believe they are really psychic and they are actually really good at reading people you know intuitive and nice kind people who really listen to what you when you say something and then they, they repeat it back to you maybe they're repeating it back to you in a different way um on purpose or maybe they're repeating it back to you not maybe not even consciously understanding that they do remember um you know hearing it and sometimes we say things like you know i said something about my children or something i can't remember what i said to the psychic and then later on she was able to pull that up with well you know about grandchildren or, or something like that it's like you know it's said here and then like a half an hour 45 minutes later it gets brought back into the conversation again in a different creative way that leads to say that you are probably like i this, something about my love life tell me about my love life and the so, thing that gets me is the obvious things they miss right like we've been talking well, about nobody no, nobody predicted the pandemic nobody predicted historic racial riots like right all these psychics they had to cancel events that they had booked you know, it's ridiculous. And again, personally, this woman sitting, you know, three feet from me on the other side of my wife for th two, three hours. Did oh, you your husband's really nice. She told my wife this. You know, I really like to get to talk to him. Oh. No idea of what's in my head that about what she That would have been a disaster. That would have been creative. No, but, but seriously, like, right? You know, her, her possibly worst enemy sitting three feet from her, and she picks up none of that, you know. It's funny but, how they don't But, but she's psychic. Yeah. Well, you know, and the psychic I talked to yesterday, I, I now that I think about it, she did. She said that she had a reading with somebody in April, who told this guy that all the shit was going to hit the fan. She saw really problematic times ahead, but didn't really understand what it all meant. And now she kind of gets it. She also told us. I asked her about the presidential election. If we're going to see, I said, I'm sure you don't want to talk about politics, but can you at least tell us if there's a change in? <laughs> of administrations because i'm sure that would be extremely a big change you know if biden makes president it's going to be a huge change whereas if it, if it was trump again it'll probably be kind of more the same you know so i would think a psychic could pick up on some huge change like that and she says she she came up with there's this woman who knows it all okay and i'm going what and everybody in the chat's going what is she talking about a woman who knows it all in new jersey and we're going what? And she's 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 going to be uncovered. Her her she does her bad things are going to be uncovered. She's got all the shady business she's doing, and we're all going to learn about it. And it turns out she's talking about Nancy Pelosi. And I'm like, Nancy Pelosi's in New Jersey. She's gonna what? She's gonna die? And they're like, she's like, no, no. She's it's going to be uncovered all the bad things she's doing. I'm like in New Jersey. <laughs> 
he says well and then she kind of is like i'm not really sure i was talking about new jersey or not but i'm like well well what do you mean and she goes well it's all gonna well, right now it's there's so much distraction going on we don't know all the things that are going on but we're gonna know about them by by next year early next year about all well, this sounds like the jeanette wilson thing that you did the the, the yeah, thing definitely. recorded where she was covid's gonna go by by the end of the year and trump's the best president ever and uh and and oh and the world is run by 300 people and oh, this is all gonna president. this is all gonna come out this year oh yeah hey it this woman made the woman i talked to made predictable claims and so did jeanette wilson so we're you know i'm waiting for this covid yeah. to appear in a second it, it's that's on jeanette wilson's wikipedia article by the way so the, yeah, the, <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand how cool this is. We're not breaking any rules or anything. We're not. When we get this stuff on the Wikipedia pages, it has to be correctly cited and with notable sources and reliable sources. And, you know, it has to be a certain way. We can't just put this stuff on there. But when we find it, we go, this has got to be on there, you know. And if somebody doesn't like think it's a good idea, they can remove it and, and leave a reason why they're removing it. And then we can talk about why they're removing it. But the point is, is that the power we have to be able to put something like that on there, people, it just didn't occur to people to do that a few years ago. Now it's like, you know, Wikipedia is the world of, of skeptics. It's the rules are the rules of skepticism. You have to have a citation to back it up. And the person well, it, to it's back a, it up. It's a, it's a, I would just say with that power available, it's just a damn good thing that the other side is not organized in this regard. They don't they don't have they, any clue how they to don't, they don't. They yeah. don't follow rules. They don't understand what evidence is. They don't understand yeah. what a reliable citation is. They think opinion is just as good as a, a fact. And every time somebody from the paranormal world has gone over to try to change a Wikipedia page, they almost always get banned and not by us. They just can't. The best one was the Tyler, the Tyler Henry one. Uh, uh, well, maybe best one besides Jeanette Wilson deleting all her stuff. But yeah, I told, I told the story on the skeptic zone, I think, uh, when I was first interviewed two years ago or so, three years ago. But um, I had worked on the Tyler Henry page. So I was watching, you know, it was on my watch list and I get notified if anybody changed anything. And all of a sudden, all the, all the criticism, the scientific skepticism went away. And, and, I, and I go, well, who did this? And I go back and it's like, I love Tyler Henry was the username for the Wikipedia ID. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> Hit one button, it's all back. And then didn't they remove it? And then in the edit summary, they said Susan Gerbic should be banned from Wikipedia. I don't remember that. I remember in, that, in that oh, case. I'm sure that's happened a lot of places. No, in exactly. this case, it was, the, the pushback was if you didn't sit with a reading by Tyler Henry, you have no right to criticize him. That was uh, yeah. that was that was priceless. And, and so people don't change Wikipedia pages, or at least they don't change for for more than a few minutes of what's put on them because we do it correctly. Right. Oh, I mentioned, I, I mentioned I was gonna say something about the flat earth thing. So yeah. there, there's a Wikipedia article called, uh, I think it's called the Modern Flat Earth Societies or something to that effect. And so like, you know, there, there, there's another page that actually tracks the historic belief that the earth was flat. But this is, you know, different. This is the modern, modern. belief past the point where anyone should believe it. Right. But it was still not really modern. It was it was not really kept up to date. There was nothing about, you know, YouTube videos or Facebook, you know, convincing people that the earth is flat. It, it was just called the Flat Earth Society, which was like a news group thing, Usenet news group thing, or even before that time, maybe emails were sent out amongst, you know, a thousand believers. That's as far as it had gotten historically. So I, I made a new section, which was resurgence of belief in flat earth in the age of modern social media, something like that. It was a ra rather long-winded name. I think somebody pared that down to something more reasonable now. But what I put there then was the current criticism was going on by Steve Novella, uh, other places in Skeptical Inquirer, writing about whose fault this was, and largely YouTube, frankly. Mm -hmm. And that was all there, right? Like a few days later, it was all gone. And somebody put, you can't do that on Wikipedia. You're, you're saying this is a ridiculous belief system. Wikipedia has to be fair and balanced. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, no. No. No, no. I, I quoted the rules of Wikipedia back to them, which is basically that no, you know, pseudoscience and and that kind of thing does not get a fair and balanced treatment on Wikipedia, and yeah, people don't that, and that shut that. them up. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. You do not have to have. We're not like the media where we have to have on a anti-vaxer if we're going to talk about vaccines. 
yeah. doesn't work like that on Wikipedia, thankfully, which is the rules. Uh, yeah. That's why I think Wikipedia is like one of the best sources at all for scientific skepticism. And we should be encouraging more people to go to Wikipedia to get their information. It, 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 um, if our arch enemies knew what they were doing, they would pool their resources, which is large, right? Because like, you know, you know, as opposed to uh, CSI and other, you know, skeptic organizations have no money because they're charities and they don't make a lot. These people who like, you know, so who sell snake oil and convince people, you know, to give all this money, they're very wealthy. And if they pulled their resources to say, hey, like maybe buy the Wikimedia Foundation, we'd be screwed. I'm just saying. I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> They'll just change all the rules. Oh, yeah, we could put anything we want. Well, that's true. It could happen, which is it why could we happen, yeah. support Wikimedia and the GSOW project. Go to our website, which is about time dot, wait, about time project dot org, and you can click on our donate button. And we are a nonprofit, so it's a uh, you can deduct it on your taxes as well. If you want to leave us something in your will, too, we're, we're, we'll help you out with <laughs> I got to pay for my Zoom account and, and all the multiple skeptic uh, psychic event things we do. And plus, we, we are going to be, when we get back to the world where we can go to conferences, we're going to be able to, um, GSO members are going to be able to go to conferences on our dime. We're going to send scholarships for people who are in the project to be able to attend conferences. What a concept. That's what we're going to do. That's our goal. So, Rob, we should go because my stomach's starting to growl. And Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. I really interesting, have interesting two and a half hours. Am I my clock right? Oh my god, hours and thirty nine minutes. But the thing is, is that these go fast. They're conversations with people that I, that are you know in my world that I find that have something interesting to say. And you're definitely in that in that world. And oh, well, thanks for inviting me. It was fun, huh? I'll see you in the cabal. <laughs> All right, you guys. We All could right. we could plot our continuous takeover of the we'll planet. Take the world, you know where. When we finally uh, Take care, everyone. look under the left tree on the right hand side, it's your left. You go out the back door. It's got some moss over it. You should be able to tell it looks like it's a little, and you look at that third rock from the left, your left, again. And you should be able to find that big part. Um, I, I, I hope it's there. I've looked a lot of places. It is there. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching, everybody. <laughs>